Okay, live stream is rolling. Sergeant, so if you could start the recordings, please. PC recording is up. Backup is rolling. All right, thank you. Sergeant Jones, you can take it away with the opening statement. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Aging and Technology. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos? And to minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. And again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. And thank you for your cooperation. And Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Council Member Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. And I would like to welcome you to today's joint oversight hearing on increasing senior access to technology. I'd like to thank Chair Holden of the Technology Committee for co-hosting this very important hearing with me. For far too long, modern technology has been labeled as solely a tool for the younger generation. However, if any moment has proven this to be false, it is this moment, access to the internet has played a critical role in surviving the current pandemic for everyone, especially our seniors. Since the very beginning of the pandemic, many older adults have been using the internet to find important information, such as where to pick up free meals, what stores have senior shopping hour, and ways in which they can protect themselves from the virus and to perform necessary tasks, such as ordering food and grocery for delivery. Further, since many older adults have been quarantining and social distancing at home since March of last year for safety, the internet has become a critical tool to help them stay connected to loved ones. The internet has helped, has helped older adults connect to others through virtual visitation platforms like FaceTime and Zoom. It has been an invaluable resource in combating loneliness and social isolation, letting many seniors stay socially and physically active by allowing them to participate in virtual classes and programming operated by our city's senior centers and other service providers. Beyond offering social connection and activity, the internet has also served our older adults as a vital resource for health services as the need and for the use of telemedicine and telehealth has rapidly increased. Accordingly to an August 2020 telehealth poll, one in four older Americans reported having a virtual medical visit during the first three months of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is much higher percentage than the 4% of adults over the age of 50 who reported a virtual visit with a doctor in 2019. Researchers are predicting that telehealth services will remain an instrumental part of society for years to come. Despite these number, not every older New Yorker has access to the internet or even to basic technology. The Brookdale Center for Healthy Aging has recently reported that there are 474,000 older New Yorkers living in household without internet access. That's one in three older New Yorkers. According to 2019 U.S. Census data, 18.8% of New York City household over the age of 65 
don't have a computer at all. This digital divide is also more prevalent among seniors who live alone, have limited English proficiency, and have lower level of formal education. In a world where the internet and technology are a necessity to our seniors' lives, we must help them bridge this divide. We as a city must make sure that our seniors are connected to the internet, have access to basic technology and are taught how to use it. At this hearing, the committees will examine the administration's effort to ensure that seniors have adequate access to internet and technology and that it is actively working to expand that access to the many seniors who have neither. Additionally, we look forward to learning more about the Department for the Aging's virtual programming and services and how they will continue to grow during the pandemic. We are also particularly interested in learning how DIFTA and the Mayor's Office of the Chief Technology Officer are working collaboratively with each other as well as with other city agency to ensure seniors have the resources they need to connect to the internet. How do we ensure we are creating and distributing technology and virtual services that are not only useful for seniors need, but which are also created with their unique conditions in mind. Seniors are using technology and their internet at a higher rate. And it's time the city take a look and how we can better help them do that. Finally, to our seniors watching this hearing, remember if you are over the age of 65 and live within New York City, you are now eligible for the COVID-19 vaccination. The city has opened COVID-19 vaccination clinic in NYCHA developments to offer on-site vaccination for those residents 65 and older. Open Clinics includes the Van Dyke one and two houses in Brooklyn, Cassidy Lafayette houses in Staten Island and Polo Grounds Tower in Manhattan. Let's make sure you get vaccinated and stay healthy. I'd like to thank the committee staff for their help in putting together this hearing. Uh, our council, Nusat Chadori, policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, finalist, analyst, Daniel Kruf and finance unit head, Doheny Sopora, and my director of legislation and communication, Kana Irvin. And I'd like to thank the other member um, of the SAP that uh, helped put this hearing together. Now I will turn it to Chair Holden for some opening remarks. Thank you, Chair Chin. Um, good morning. I am Council Member Robert Holden, Chair of the Committee on Technology, and I want to welcome everyone to our hearing. I am pleased to join the Committee on Aging, chaired by my colleague, Council Member Chin. Uh, today, we will focus on increasing senior access to technology, which is especially important today. Uh, technology has played an essential role in our lives, which is increasing now in response to the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, for seniors, access to the internet is particularly vital uh, as we continue to practice social distancing and combat the virus. Unfortunately, not every household has broadband access and not every household has a device or technology for online access. Uh, according, uh, accordingly, uh, it's, it's the recent uh, data from the US Census uh, Bureau in New York City, about 20% of residents aged 65 or older do not have a computer at home. Further, only 71% of seniors with a computer have a broadband subscription. Accessibility and affordability are common factors for a lack of access, but uh, these are not the only factors that leave seniors behind. Uh, studies have shown that many seniors are not comfortable using computers and technology in general, and often need someone to assist them with setting up and using electronic devices. 
Uh, the ability to access and competently navigate the internet was important before, but it is crucial now, as information about the COVID-19 vaccine rollout is mostly available online. Um, the process of scheduling COVID-19 vaccines in New York City is not easy. I can attest to that, especially for the elderly who may not be familiar with uh, browsing the internet. I have heard so many complaints from constituents who find this online process very, very difficult. The portal often redirects you to other websites uh, and then you, you run into a nightmare of uh, pages and pages. Some of those sites require extensive information to book an appointment, including an email address that some older New Yorkers may not have. Uh, other websites just keep crashing. Uh, this experience is frustrating for everyone, but can be exhausting for seniors. Uh, there's no question that technology is having an increasing role in our society, and we must make sure that seniors do not get left behind. To protect this uh, growing class of citizens, we should take concrete steps and work with the administration to, to ensure that older New Yorkers have access to resources um, often uh, available primarily through the internet. We look forward to hearing the valuable testimonies from the administration, experts, and community advocates uh, on this important issue. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, members of uh, members who are council members who are on on this uh, hearing is Council Member Valone, Council Member Yeager, Council, council Member Deutsch, Council Member Landa, Council Member Ayala, and Council Member Rose. Um, I would like to thank our technology committee staff, Council Irene Bahovsky, uh, policy analyst Charles Kim, and finance analyst Florentine Kabor, and the staff of the Committee on Aging for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. Also, my, staff, my chief of staff, Daniel Cosina, and communications uh, legislative director, Kevin Ryan. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Chin, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, so uh, we have our first panel um, of um, advocates and service providers. Thank you, Chair. Um, oh. I'm Nuzat Chowdhury, counsel to the Committee on Aging. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling on, on panelists to testify. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists uh, to testify, so please listen for your name to be called. I will also be periodically announcing who the next panelists will be. Before we hear from the administration today, we will hear testimony from the following individuals. Caitlin Andrews from Live On New York, followed by Margaret Rao from Bay Ridge Senior Center, followed by Alfreda Holland from Bay Ridge Senior Center, followed by David Dring from Bay Ridge Senior Center. Panelists, I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, Please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. This includes both questions and answers. Please also note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questions. Thank you. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call on your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to, to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. We will begin this hearing with public testimony from senior service providers. As a reminder, I will be calling on individuals one by one to testify in panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the, the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on after the entire panel has com completed testimony. First, we will hear from Caitlin Andrews from Live On New York. Please begin after the sergeant gives you the cue. Time begins now. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Caitlin Andrews. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Live on New York. Live on New York's members include more than 100 community-based nonprofits that provide core services to all New Yorkers. Bay Ridge is one of those that you'll hear next. 
Throughout the pandemic, the entire Aging Services Network has found new ways to provide critical services to older New Yorkers. Tech is what made this possible. And it's important because isolation is now known to be a greater predictor of mortality than things such as cigarettes, obesity. It's a really important issue that we need to be addressing. And unfortunately, for too many older New Yorkers, financial barriers, connectivity issues, or lack of training inhibit their ability to get online and find the resources that exist. Encour encouragingly, both the city and state are beginning to address this issue. For example, the city's tablet distribution program is a positive step, and the governor recently outlined intent to mandate $15 per month high-speed internet for low-income families. Live on New York encourages the state to ensure that program eligibility for this initiative is inclusive of low-income older New Yorkers. One of our members, PSS, surveyed more than 700 older adult participants, finding the lowest tech usage among their senior center attendees, with many having no personal means to access the internet, whether it be through Wi-Fi or cell service. Many clients reported that only a basic cell phone was their ability to connect with the outside world throughout the entirety of the pandemic. These findings underscore the urgency of the following recommendations. It's critical that centers, senior centers that are the connection point for so many older adults have the infrastructure they need to continue to connect. The um, de Blasio administration previously promised $10 million annually to senior centers that never went through. This was to right-size senior center budgets. If we're underfunding the budgets that we know senior centers need, we're not allowing them to fully engage and support older New Yorkers virtually or otherwise. This should be addressed. Similarly, the indirect cost rate is an initiative promised by the de Blasio administration that has not gone through. This needs to be addressed. We, can, we need to fully fund the indirect cost rate. Much of this funding goes towards the back end software that would support virtual opportunities. We also need to prepare for reopening. So many um, seniors utilize computer labs and senior centers to get online. So we need a plan for how will these spaces reopen and how will we keep those computer labs safe into the future. We also know that we need to make sure that when we're distributing information such as the vaccine, that non-tech options are not second tier. If there's going to be a hotline, there shouldn't be waits for it. Every single system that we create needs to be accessible via technology. And we know that we can do this. And I'm really excited to see some of the success stories and hear from a senior participant as well as an instructor to show how great these programs can be. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Next, we'll hear from Margaret Rao of Bay Ridge Senior Center. Time begins now. Hello, City Council members. My name is Margaret Rao. I am a social work master's student at Hunter College, and I am serving as an intern this year with Bay Ridge Center in Brooklyn, New York. My primary responsibilities at the center are conducting wellness check-in calls and facilitating weekly virtual programs. One of the programs I host is called What's Driving You Crazy, which is styled loosely like a support group. I've learned a great deal from these conversations about what the pandemic experience has been for Brooklyn Night older adults. I have heard numerous stories of people feeling isolated, lonely, fearful, and sad. There is a shared sentiment echoed amongst Bay Ridge Center members that because of the pandemic, they are now living in what feels like a void, just waiting for conditions to change so they can resume life. Many adults have wholeheartedly heeded the warnings by health professionals and have committed to leaving the house only for absolute essentials and unavoidable appointments. For some, that means that they are isolated without social interaction for weeks or months on end. Staying connected while taking physical health seriously has been a precarious balancing act, impacting some older adults in severe ways. The center offers over 30 virtual programs that create a range of opportunities for people to engage and voice their experiences with their community. In this setting, I have had the opportunity to act as a witness and supporter. I get a glimpse into some specific issues in the position I hold, such as how for the many low income older adults I work with, 
they do not have the discretionary income to afford the technological devices or internet connectivity necessary to participate consistently or at all in our virtual programming. I have seen how virtual programming can foster healing spaces for older adults as they navigate some incredible hardships. In my What's Driving You Crazy program, we have discussed topics like cognitive distortions or otherwise known as unhelpful thinking patterns. When spending a great deal of time ruminating on potential outcomes, we tend to catastrophize and think about worst case scenarios and I've observed individuals begin to identify and work beyond these unhelpful thinking styles as a group. Some of the older adults who attend my program have developed friendships with neighbors they've never met before, and others have built their networks stronger. On the calls and in the groups, I observe that there are still gaps between what is available and what is needed. I see the importance of these groups in creating an atmosphere of community and an opportunity to talk and work through issues during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Next, we will hear from Alfreda Holland of Bay Ridge Senior Center. Time begins now. Alfreda, are you on? Maybe having some technical difficulties. Should I start over again? Oh, sorry. Okay, we can hear you now. Yes, please. Hello, members of City Council. I'm Alfreda Holland, member of Bay Ridge Center. I lived in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn for 50 years. I retired in September 2019. I have a desktop computer that I use occasionally and recently obtained an iPhone XR. I'm fortunate that my neighbor allows me to use his Wi-Fi connection to access the internet at high speed. Both my desktop and iPhone use that connection. Since I don't have a webcam or speakers for my desktop computer, I use my iPhone to connect to several virtual classes offered by Bay Ridge Center and other organizations that I am affiliated with. They have been enjoyable, educational, and helpful during this pandemic. I was asked to testify today to explain the challenges I have encountered as they relate to obtaining affordable high-speed internet connectivity. But my neighbor is moving, so I will not be able to share his generous connectivity much longer. While I have been told there are multiple service providers, it seems that there are only two that service my building, Verizon and possibly Spectrum. Both offer a discount pro uh, program, but I do not qualify for either. Spectrum is suggesting that I pay $49.99 for 200 megabytes per second when I don't need that much speed for myself, plus an additional $5 per month for a Wi-Fi router. That's approximately $55 plus all the taxes and fees. It's nearly $65 per month. Interestingly, Verizon is similar. They offer 300 megabytes per second for $39.99 per month and separately charge for their Wi-Fi router at $15 per month for an approximately $55 monthly fee, plus all the taxes and fees, so that is similar to Spectrum 65 per month. The additional 100 megabytes per second is meaningless to me, as I'm the only person in my apartment and I only have two devices. I never planned for internet connectivity, so this is an extra expense. My income is now fixed and I'll be affected by the additional payments of $65 per month. I fully appreciate the benefits of participating in the virtual programs, browsing the internet, eating mail, emailing, and other opportunities of the World Wide Web. Access to the internet is essential. I do not have a choice. I decided to give this testimony specifically to implore you to consider alternatives that will make it more affordable for older adults like myself to access this essential service. It's practically a utility and I would encourage you to make it as easy as possible for older adults to benefit from it. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, we will hear from David Ring of Bay Ridge Senior Center. Hello, I'm Dave. Um, I'm the Director of Innovation Programs at the Bay Ridge Center. I'm honored to be here and have the chance to present to you on the need for low cost, high speed internet connectivity. I'm among the team that rapidly pivoted from on-site to virtual programming in March last year. 
Today, we average 30 virtual programs a week across a range of topics, including arts, education, health management, nutrition, physical exercise, support groups, recreation, and technology. In this fiscal year already, we have delivered over 580 virtual classes to over 7,000 older adults, but we are still missing many people in the Bay Ridge area. You've heard from Margaret and Alfreda now on the value of these virtual programs, yet we are only reaching a fraction of those who could benefit from low cost, high speed internet connectivity. There are several companies shown to offer broadband connectivity in the Bay Ridge area, including Atlantic Broadband, Optimum, RCN, Spectrum, and Verizon. But our research shows that only two actually do, just the ones that Alfreda mentioned, Spectrum and Verizon. And Alfreda testified that they have similar rates of about $65 per month, which is not affordable. The city of Boston is working with RCN and Comcast to offer a complete package for only $10 a month. AT&T offers a senior discount program also for $10 a month. The AT&T plan provides 25 uh, megabits per second, which is sufficient for a single person to be able to access video, stre uh, streaming, uh, email, uh, web browsing, and all of the things that the previous council members had mentioned about uh, the connection to setting up vaccine appointments. And these programs are truly affordable for seniors. The eligibility for the Boston program is just being an older adult. The AT&T program does require a person to participate in SNAP. The income threshold to qualify for SNAP as an older adult is $25,512 for a single person. If there must be an income level, SNAP is more preferable than SSI, which is only $12,880, which is the eligibility for both the Spectrum and the Verizon program here in New York City. There is a precedent within New York City for an older adult program to be offered citywide without a means test. That's a home delivered meal. There are also federal subsidy programs through the Federal Communications Council called Lifeline. Lifeline offers a monthly, monthly benefit of up to $9.25 towards phone or internet services for eligible subscribers. I would recommend to the council three paths moving forward. Like Boston, work with the existing providers to offer truly low cost, high speed connectivity, to change the plans, not offer such high broadband, but lower so that it can be cost appropriate so, and reduce their costs and change their eligibility. Open up New York City to another vendor, such as AT&T, to enable them to provide their $10 a month program. Well, I'm okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, David. And thank you to our first panel. I'll now turn it back to the chair. Uh, in the meantime, council members, if you have any questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Chair Chen. Thank you. Uh, really, thank you to this panel. Um, and thank you to the, uh, the staff at the Bay Ridge Center. Um, I know also Caitlin talked about the, uh, the funding. So I just wanted to like, Alfreda, yeah, I see you. Yeah. And uh, I just wanted to um, ask you that when, when you were um, at the senior center, did you utilize the computer lab uh, at the center um, to do some communication technology, you know, connecting with friends or did you participate in the classes to learn about the computer, how to use the computer and how to use the internet? I attended some classes that were given by Rachel uh, for smart for smartphone. Oh, okay. But they stopped, of course. That's true. I mean, like, uh, yeah, we've seen a lot of senior centers uh, uh, having volunteer that help, you know, train seniors how to use their smartphone. Uh, my other question is to David. Can you just finish up your recommendation? Um, okay. Sure. So just for the city to consider a provider own uh, where the city would actually provide low cost, high speed connectivity to city properties um, and low income mm -hmm. families. There is such a need uh, and there is the capacity within the city to be able to provide that, I believe. And therefore, you, the, the city um, would be able to address the loneliness uh, that and isolation that older adults are facing and ensuring that they're having the access to life-sustaining 
uh, services. Thank you very much. Yeah, and then we also know that some federal money are supposed to be coming. Uh, so definitely we have to work on that. I'll pass it over to, to Chair Holden. Yes, um, thank you, Chair Chin. Uh, I have a couple of questions um, or just um, some comments also to the first panel. Um, I, uh, how did, does your senior center, the Bay Ridge Center, um, do they, do you guys um, help um, your, obviously your seniors make appointments uh, or, or try to maneuver through making an appointments for the vaccine? Yes, uh, we are doing that both over the phone with people um, and uh, excuse me, actually, actually all of the services are doing, been doing over the phone, um, but sometimes we'll use the computer on their behalf to try to find and identify appointment locations. For the most part, we've been uh, having a lot of difficulty in being able to find places close by or those that would be easily accessible by a bus route um, to be able to get to. Uh, the Bay Ridge Center does have some money to be able to provide Uber transportation uh, to people who can't get to a location close by uh, uh, when, when, when they're available. But uh, we've not been uh, extraordinarily successful. It seems like by Wednesday, all the appointments are, are quickly booked up. All right. Uh, Margaret, do you, you're shaking your head. Do you have anything uh, to add to that? Um, yeah, I agree that it has been an incredible challenge to try to connect willing, interested older adults who want the vaccine with the vaccine right now. It's been a frustration. So how many of you have wasted time on trying to make that appointment? You go down third party websites and or you go even to a pharmacist who, who uh, and I tried calling some pharmacists in my area that were issuing the uh, vaccine. And to every pharmacist said, we, we, uh, we're, you know, we, we're getting so many calls, we don't uh, call next week, call the following week. Um, and I, I experienced uh, just going on and filling out several forms with my uh, medical information and personal information only to find a dead end where they said, um, you don't qualify for the Moderna without an, ex you know, an explanation. Did anybody find these frustrating parts of uh, you know, the health and hospitals website or nyc.gov? This is, this is the challenge across the board. We're hearing from our entire network of senior center providers, just constant challenges and dead ends and even waiting on hold um, through the hotline and getting disconnected after hours waiting. Um, and, and additionally, for those that want to assist an older adult in registering for the vaccine, through the um, registration portals, you need an email address at some point to actually put in for the vaccine. So people are like making up email addresses so that they can help multiple people and, and using their personal one. So we're just seeing a, a consistent um, sort of over-reliance on technology and misunderstanding that many older adults don't have an email address to utilize it. And that's really a barrier or at least an extra step that, that takes time and by the time that you get it all set up that slot has been taken. Right, I found that with the doing the, the filling out the forms for my mom who's 96, she doesn't have an email address but it requires an email address to move on. So yeah. you're in a catch 22 automatically. And even the technology that you, you said that they rely on uh, heavily on technology but the technology is awful. Uh, <laughs> you know, you should have one place where you could, you know, make it, you fill out your information and find out the available vaccines in your area, the closest one, and then make the appointment all in one you know, step or three, even if three steps, but here you're, you're going to 50 steps and then just you, you, you go on to a dead end. But I just wanna ask um, the, the senior center, um, what is your suggestion for the vaccine rollout? What would you say is the best way to reach your members? Uh, that's a, a great idea, great suggestion. And from a technological perspective, it would be wonderful to sort of reorient the sign-in process, the, the online form, so that you could do just what you mentioned. You know, be able to say, I live in Bay Ridge, where is the closest available vaccine that I can go to? If, even if it, was, if it was done in that way, we as staff members could then help our, our clients know where to be able to go. And we could 
enter in information for them so that that information was available for them. Um, otherwise, there it would be great for us to kind of to for us to get some sort of communication about how many vaccines are going to what places in our neighborhood. So if we knew that the one of the 24-hour places is the Brooklyn Marine uh, Terminal that they had 100,000 plate, you know, vaccines, then we would, you know, try to direct and, and use that one location to send all of our, our clients to. Otherwise, like you said, we have to go to all whatever hundred of different places in Brooklyn to be able to find a possible place. And each time we have to restart the process from the beginning. Right. Um, that's very uh, time consuming. Uh, I've, I've spent over an hour and a half with just one particular uh, client only to not find a vaccine location. She just became so frustrated we decided to do it again the next day. We spent an hour the next day and we're just continuing to try to find an, a possibility. Anybody else? Suggestions? Uh, aside from technology, oh, this is my last question, uh, Chair. Uh, aside from technology, let's say rolling out the, the vaccine and trying to reach seniors, let's put the technology aside now because we don't have a uh, a good website to do that. And we just, what I said is uh, the nyc.gov is a, you know, how to access the vaccine. It's a, it's a glorified uh, store uh, locator uh, because that's all it does. It locates, you know, here's your vaccine area, but try to make an appointment, you can't. Um, but aside, let's say, put technology aside for a second. Um, how else would you reach seniors with the vaccine? You, you guys are the experts. How, how would you suggest to the city that they roll out the vaccine to your, to your members, to, to your seniors? Probably the, what would be a phenomenal way to do it was to use our center um, to give us the number uh -huh. of doses. That's right. That's exactly okay. what we were talking about right. yesterday. Use your centers to roll out the vaccine. Use the senior centers. They exist. Your, your seniors know it. They know where it is. Yep. Thank you. I'm sorry, David. I, I just get you. Go ahead. You continue. I'm sorry. <laughs> and one thing, we, we one thing to add, we know that seniors trust their center. If they were to come to the senior center and see the director getting a shot, that might make them a little bit more likely to accept the vaccination as well. And similarly, we have hundreds of HUD 202 buildings that hundreds yes. and thousands of seniors live in. We could be in lobbies vaccinating to the extent that supply is the problem. Totally understand that we need the federal government to step in there. But to the extent that we can be doing a better job of reaching seniors where they are, that would be a really wonderful improvement. And, and Kate, the added benefit to that would be more seniors would know about your senior center because uh, some obviously don't go to the senior centers, but all of a sudden, if they had to go there for the vaccine, they would find it, oh, this is a nice place, it's great, uh, and they meet other people, and it's very, very important, uh, and I think we're missing that opportunity now, um, but anybody I would, else? I would just add that we have uh, a number of partnerships with local nursing programs that come and do health programs, so I'm sure we would be able to get the nurses um, or student nurses to be in our building, in our center, to uh, be able to allow that to come to, uh, to facilitate those vaccinations. Okay, um, thank you, Chair. I, I just wanna mention, we've been joined by Council Member Traeger and uh, Council Member Ulrich. Thank you, Chair. Oh, thank, thank you, you, Chair Holden. Um, I just wanted to add to that. I mean, that's what we've been telling the administration. You know, we have the infrastructure ready, the senior building, the NORCs, the senior center, utilize them. And when they have this vaccine action center or whatever, um, and they set up a task force to, to talk about how to provide vaccine to older adults. Kaylin, right, they haven't even met yet? They did no. meet, they met twice now. Oh, okay, um, they so finally is moving ahead. Yeah. But the infrastructure is there. I mean, we just need to get the vaccine and we can work with the centers and the, and the, the senior housing you know, provider and, and get our uh, senior vaccinated. Oh, I think I, I saw, think I saw council, council member Deutsch, Deutsch raising, raising his hand for question. Yeah, hi, I'm sorry. Do you hear me? Do you yeah. hear me now? Okay, I just have my dog in the background barking. 
Uh, yes, I just want to, th I want to thank uh, Councilmember Holden for bringing up the vaccine uh, question and the issues on, on seniors being vaccinated. And we all know that even if you do get an appointment, it's a hurdle for senior to actually go down and wait in line uh, to many of these uh, vaccine locations where they have to wait in line for sometimes a number of hours just to get the vaccine. But what I wanted to bring up, which I think is important to reach out to our senior population, is to maybe try to push the administration, which I've spoken to, that they should get the vaccine to, to the doctors that have Medicare patients. And no one knows their seniors better than the doctors. Um, and I think that's a way to reach out to as many seniors as possible to make sure they get vaccinated. And in particular, in my district, I have a very large senior population. And unfortunately, my COVID rate in my district is pretty high. And uh, I think it's important that, um, that we do roll out the vaccination and put more pressure on the on government to make sure that uh, our senior population gets reached out to uh, through the senior providers, through, through the Medicare doctors, the, the doctors that accept Medicare. And um, it's only with um, speaking to, to people, speaking to doctors to find out where the patients are and have them locate them. It's the only way we're going to be able to get the, get the seniors vaccinated. Unfortunately, in the city, one doesn't know what the other one is doing, and that is a major problem. So I just want to bring that up, uh, reaching out to the doctors who have Medicare patients. Thank you. Um, committee council, other council member? Have uh, yes, I see that council member Valone also has his hand raised. Time begins. Okay, thank you. And especially to the co-chairs, uh, Mighty Margaret, you know, we love you. You have been defending our seniors for the eight years we've been working together. And co-chair Robert Holden, this is gonna be a wonderful and a perfect way for you to continue this conversation after our battle for the last eight years uh, and to the DIFTA workers and those who are testifying today. Thank you for always helping. I think that the overall topic of the hearing is so many things that Morgan and I wanna bring up with questions about providing the technological support to seniors. But as the council members have noticed when we're in this pandemic and how they started talking, it kind of gets overshadowed by the only thing that really matters, which is vaccinating our seniors and our people in the city. Um, so two separate things. And you may have you may have mentioned it before, and I apologize, there's so many multitasking things on when you're doing these hearings. Has there been an active plan or role that you have played in providing knowledge to the seniors who meet the requirements to get the vaccination that DIFTA or any city agency has now reached out either through phone call or email to advise our seniors? that this is what they have to do to register online. And this is probably your closest sites to do it with. Has there been any active plan directly by you to do that? So um, at, as the Bay Ridge Center, we're doing wellness check-in calls with people uh, every uh, day uh, so that we reach um, all of our seniors. And for the most part, everyone that's in part of our program is over 65. We're encouraging them if they have the technology, what is the website address to be able to reach with, to connect to, or if we can, we'll take some time to try to help them get uh, you know, on, on their behalf connected to a local vaccination center. Okay, so that, that's a great step on, on your part. That's something that you're individually doing and that's, that's, that's commendable. So do you have any data on of those seniors that are within your network? on how many you have been able to reach and how many you have not been able to reach? Because that might be in a way a microcosm to give us an example, because that's a difficult yeoman's task to do, to call each one and make sure that, they're, that you're giving them that information and how to log in and how to do that. Because I know with my parents and the seniors in my life and the seniors in my district, they have been unable to navigate the insanity that has been put out there on these portals, uh, upgrading, up. Uh, uploading the documents and this one's not here and you want to go to the Bronx at seven o'clock at night. It's the state sites are different than the city, city sites and now the fear of everything's going to run out. So um, I'm just saying, I don't think that's enough. 
But I mean, that's exactly what love is your personal attention. Because that's the only way my mom and dad would get it through is if you personally called them and guided them through. And this is the first speaker of the council and he still needs to help to get through those. I mean, I still got to help with emails to that aside. But, but that goes to show you what the, the difficulties our seniors are facing. I think we need to take a much broader approach, agency-wide approach that we mandate interaction with our seniors through this because the process is going to change now it's always going to evolve right there's going to be new pop-up sites there's going to be new procedures there's going to be new guidelines on a state and a city level that we are all still navigating so imagine what's happening on the senior level of trying to navigate all that so as we're preparing for the new batches of vaccines and trying to expand that we should now have a plan or tomorrow or Monday on how to advise as soon as we know those next steps, what are the group here going to do to advise their seniors on how to quickly navigate that new schematic? I mean, from the Bay Ridge perspective, I really think the opportunity to use the senior centers as a hub for that, uh, you know, that vaccination, I think would be a, a terrific opportunity really for two reasons. Um, one, because it's already known. And two, for the most part, the people that come to the senior center are often the folks that don't have a lot of the technology themselves. And so they're looking to use the senior center to be their sense of connectivity because they don't have other means of doing that to, to a large extent. So I would, um, you know, if, if there would be a way that we could use it as a hub, I think we would be able to inoculate a lot of seniors um, and to really be able to. And I agree with you, but that's the point because you're saying if there was a way, we need to establish that way. I'm not saying you individually, that's why we're having this theory. We need to create a plan citywide on how we can activate every senior sense of every provider, every third party provider to have a uniform way to reach out via call, email, or they're coming in. And the reason why Margaret and I fought so hard for virtual senior centers, because for a lot of seniors, you know, can't meet. So we would, sorry guys, but th this, I just want to finish it. Those virtual senior centers, which is part of this technology hearing, and DIFTA hearing, why we fought for them, but those tablets were so expensive and so hard to get into the hands of seniors and to get those programs up that that's not even a viable option because I know unless we funded it individually as council members, it didn't happen. And it was such an expensive initiative to fund um, that we didn't set up a template or a basis to prepare for this crisis because only a very small percentage of seniors have that technology. So we have to find a way through technology and through DIFTA and through aging to, to quickly, like they had to do for the students and the schools to get them all laptops. We can't do that with our seniors. So we need to find another way to get that information to them. It may be like exactly what you're doing, which is reaching out, calling them, finding out who the guardian is or who the family member is to help them through, but now's the time to do that. Uh, thank you, co-chairs, for allowing me to, to just put my two cents on that. But I say, where are, you have been battling, and I, I thank God we have Council Member Holden who can continue that battle going on uh, in the subsequent years. But if, if there's a call, that might be something that we could quickly all unify on as a plan, a unified plan to address, get that knowledge out to the seniors on a simplified, email and or call or notice to a senior as to this is what's happening, uh, you know, and this is how you do it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Vallon. I see that Council Member Rose also uh, has a question. Thank you. Um, I have a, a quick question. Um, some organizations in my district have reached out to my office um, to uh, requesting a change in purpose of funds in order to purchase more laptops and tablets for their new online programming. Um, they stated that DIFTA will not approve their request to purchase equipment to distribute to their program participants. Have any of you experienced this? And, um, and what's been you know, the outcome of of your requests? Or have you had a need to um, purchase more equipment? Um, I can only, I'm, I don't, I'm not the liaison to DIFTA, so I don't know the, the, the sort of the joys of doing that budget activity. But as the technology person, um, I have had the, the pleasure of being able 
to create some tech loaner programs that we've been able to implement throughout uh, our, our community. And that's part of the reason why we wanted to be so vocal on the cost, the need for low cost internet connection, because if you can provide a $200 tablet to somebody, then you have to pay $65 a month for an internet connection. That's, and then that's forever. That's very expensive over the long term for all parties involved. So if there was lower cost internet connectivity, that could make more people be able to get these devices and be able to connect. I, I can add a little bit from what I have heard similar experiences that shifting funds can be a difficult process, especially knowing there might be um, incentive for agencies to find savings that might misalign with the flexibility for um, agencies to approve changes in how funds are being spent. Um, I don't know if that's an across the board policy or it, it might be varying depending on who your fiscal officer is. Um, some might be more flexible in that respect. I think overall we should really be looking at how the budgets are constructed from the beginning and, and make sure that there is funding from technology so that they're not trying to shift from other budget lines. But from the start, we should have an investment in all senior centers to make sure that they have funds to purchase um, tablets for their instructors to purchase Wi-Fi to make these investments as well as to fund marketing. There's no marketing budget in a senior center, so they have no ability to uh, pay for a Facebook post to connect with the 50 plus individuals in their neighborhood who might not know about the senior center. Um, to do a Facebook post saying you can get vaccinated here should we get um, to that point. So th there's certainly a lot of gaps within the senior center budget that we would love to see addressed. Uh, so that way we're not looking to pull from other funds where we have accruals, but it's just there and, and we're fully funding everything that a senior center might need. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, that um, the funding was adequate. And if not, um, everybody found themselves in a situation that hadn't been planned for. And so um, I just don't want there to be impediments to people being able to provide the um, uh, the equipment that our seniors need uh, to be able to you know function throughout this pandemic, and um, especially in light of the fact that everything seems to require that um, an online registration, um, and I, I think it's, it's it's a travesty that. Um, vaccinations are are tied to their online connection, their ability to utilize or navigate the online connection. And, um, and we haven't really made sure that all of our seniors are able to do that. So um, uh, thank you. I just wanted to know if we were um, able to supply the need and if not, if there was some flexibility, if, if your experience had determined whether or not you had the flexibility to, to meet the need. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, there's a question from Council Member Ayala. Hi, good morning, everyone. I think my question is is really um, geared towards the uh, distribution of tablets that happened um, in the beginning of COVID. Does anyone know if there was um if there was an effort to connect those seniors that already knew how to use a tablet with the tab the actual tablet, or were um, the tablets just distributed arbitrarily so that you know when we're, we're not sure if the seniors that actually have possession of them can even use them. I, I'm unaware as to how exactly the distribution was chosen. I know it was targeted at NYCHA buildings and there was follow-up um, from Oates Senior Planet to assist individuals who did not have um, the understanding of how to utilize the tablet to make sure that they're getting some training to fully utilize that. I don't know the process in which those tablets were determined who exactly would be receiving them other than it was in NYCHA. Now, I know that seat, that um, that night, that DIFTA has been 
hosting some activities virtually, um, some more successfully than others. Is, is there anyone that's capturing um, that data to find out how successful virtual um, programming has been at the senior centers? I know that at the community boards, I mean, they're seeing the largest numbers of people participating than they've ever seen. Um, you know, there are others that, that share similar experiences. Is that the case for the Department for the Aging? Is that the case for the senior centers? Because I think it's, I've, I, I'm not yet sold on the idea that um, this is kind of caught on. Um, and I think that I've been at some virtual events that are very well attended. And then I've heard about others where you have maybe two or three participants from a single senior center. Yeah, I think across senior centers, the proliferation of virtual programming is incredible. We have a resource page on our website that actually catalogs all the senior centers that we're aware of that are off offering virtual programs. So like an older adult could go on there and choose one that focuses on art classes and really find what is important to them. Um, to the, ex the extent to which we know how many seniors are logging on on an average day. I, I don't have that data. I would imagine that these numbers are being captured through the senior centers. They're inputting it into STARS and the Department for the Aging could at some point um, report out on that. That would be wonderful to learn how has the engagement changed throughout the pandemic? Are we continuing to attract more individuals? Um, but to a certain extent, until we're able to make sure that all older adults have access, we're going to continue to have pockets of the city where people just can't get online. And for the most part, that's going to be the hardest hit communities to COVID where, where folks have the lowest income. So it's certainly not um, until we have universal broadband, it's not going to be an equitable system. Understood, but I think that if you know, I know most of a lot of my seniors were recipients of the uh, of the free um, laptops, the iPads, um, but they're they're still not connecting, and that concerns me because if someone is capturing that data, you know, we know that the senior centers have been closed for many months. We know the depression run, runs rampant, and you know, there's a correlation between poverty and and mental health, um, and so it concerns me that you know we may potentially have access to the data, but not are not coordinating programs and services, and really. Um, planning out um, around that information. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate uh, you guys coming to testify this morning. Um, obviously, this is an important uh, subject matter, and I, I look forward to, to continuing this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. We have no further Council Member questions, so I'll turn it back to Chair Chin. Oh, right. Yeah, and we also have been joined uh, by Council Member Constantini. Any other Council Member join? So I guess we'll call the uh, administration panel so Committee Council can swear them in. Thank you. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Michael Bosnick, De Deputy Commissioner for DIFTA, Kate Homan, Director of Research and Future Planning at the Mayor's Office of the Chief Technology Officer, Guillermo Cruz, Associate Commissioner for DIFTA, and Sarah Sanchala, Director of Government Affairs for DIFTA. I will first read the oath, and after, I will call on each of you to individually respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy Commissioner Bosnick? I do affirm. Kate Homan? Guillermo Cruz? I do affirm. Sarah Sanchala? Yes. Kate Homan, are you there? I am, yes, I do affirm, thank you. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Bosnick, you may begin when ready. Good morning. Thank you, Chairpersons Chin and Holden and members of the Committee on Aging and Committee on Technology. 
I am Michael Bosnick, Deputy Commissioner of Planning, Evaluation, Research, and Training at the New York City Department for the Aging, known as NYC Aging. I am joined today by Guillermo Cruz, Associate Commissioner of Community Services. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today about increasing access to technology for older adults. In a 2017 Pew Research Center National Survey, 67% of adults ages 65 and older say they go online. That's up from 14% in the year 2000. But rates of internet and broadband adoption also differ considerably by household income and educational attainment. Of seniors whose annual household income is $75,000 or more, 94% say they go online and 87% have high speed internet at home. Those shares drop to 46% and 27% respectively among older adults living in households earning less than $30,000 a year. According to the New York City internet plan issued in January, 2020, only 40% of New Yorkers over the age of 65 and living alone have a broadband internet connection at home, a situation that has intensified the negative health risks of COVID-19 and social isolation. Technology has become a literal lifeline providing a link to government information, emergency notifications, access to benefits and financial management tools, delivery of food and household essentials and connection to services such as telephone, uh, telemedicine and online psychological counseling. Access to technology is not just the device itself, but access to reliable broadband internet as well. Older adults must be able to use online resources, especially during COVID-19 in order to stay safely at home and connected to their family, friends, loved ones. Combating social isolation has always been a top priority for the agency. Social isolation occurs when a person has little to no contact with anyone else. In older adults, it can be harmful to their well being and lead to a variety of serious health problems, including depression, cognitive impairment, and heart disease. During the pandemic, NYC Aging and our providers have also been doing case management calls and wellness check-in calls. These calls have an essential purpose, not only to check in on the older adults, but to provide referrals to services like food, friendly visiting, elder abuse programs, mental health, and other services the city has set up during COVID. To date, almost 2.9 million calls have been placed with over 191,000 older adults reached. COVID-19 has exacerbated social isolation. With older New Yorkers asked to stay indoors, many have been cut off from friends and family. Technology access is a bridge to reducing this isolation. Not only does it enable older adults to connect to programs and vital resources such as the above, it also allows older adults access to healthcare, information, programming, entertainment, and engagement with family and friends. NYC Aging is fortunate to receive funding for the New York City Connected Communities Program, first from the uh, DOIT, the NYC Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, and then during this administration from the Mayor's Office of the Chief Technology Officer known as MOCTO. The goal of this program is to promote digital literacy and provide seniors with internet access. Only 18% of older adults say they are comfortable learning new technologies on their own, presenting a major roadblock to digital inclusion efforts that focus only on devices and connectivity. This program provides the supports needed for older adults to safely learn new technology. NYC Aging contracted with Older Adult Technology Services, known as OATS, to provide ongoing technology support and education. OATS maintains computer labs at older adult centers, also known as senior centers, provides center members with computer training, sustains a seniors oriented website, and operates a technology center for older adults. OATS offers technology classes at 22 older adult centers and the Senior Plan Planet Exploration Technology Center, which they operate as well. Currently, virtual technology trainings are offered in five languages, English, Spanish, Bengali, Russian, and Mandarin and Cantonese. So far in fiscal year 2021, OATS has facilitated almost 600 virtual training sessions that have included over 60,000 participants. 
In addition to the Technology Center, OATS also operates the Senior Planet website that shares information and resources that support aging, with a particular focus on technology's role in helping older adults connect, stay healthy, and enjoy life. In addition to articles written especially for Senior Planet, the site includes a calendar of local events of interest to seniors. NYC Aging is also pleased to have facilitated tablet distribution for several groups of older adults, including those living in New York City Housing Authority developments and those who are kinship caregivers. Led by the Mayor's Office of the Chief Technology Officer, with support from NYCHA and from NYC Aging, the city delivered 10,000 free Wi-Fi equipped tablets to older NYCHA residents during the summer. NYC Aging again contracted with the NYC-based not-for-profit Older Adults Technology Services to provide outreach, support, and training focused on the use of tablet devices to combat social isolation, to connect with family and friends, to access critical health information, improve financial security, increase access to benefits, and engage effectively with government services and local community resources during the COVID emergency and its aftermath. OATS launched a new multilingual call center staffed by professional trainers, which has made thousands of phone calls to confirm device receipt and help recipients get acquainted with their tablet, create email addresses, access specific websites and resources, and log into Zoom in order to be able to take advantage of virtual programs. A collection of handouts and welcome videos designed to acclimate the NYCHA residents to basic functions of their new devices was also created. OATS also developed and implemented a new five-week course called Android Essentials, complete with a printed and mailed course manual to walk seniors step-by-step -step through using email, taking photos, accessing websites, and getting in touch with family and friends. Shorter one-time training sessions were also developed to engage those who may not want to commit to a five-week course. To date, they have provided 630 hours of virtual training to tablet recipients. Offering multimodal, high-touch support through the mail, on the phone, and through virtual programs has successfully empowered even total technology novices to be able to use their devices to stay connected. OATS has conducted more than 47,000 phone calls with device recipients that range anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes long, helping them feel confident and comfortable enough to use their device to attend religious services, use telemedicine, and pursue further online resources. Additionally, NYC Aging distributed more than 370 tablets to grandparents and relative kinship caregivers through our Grandparent Resource Center. This was funded through the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and the Foster Parent Grant. These tablets serve to connect GRC, Grandparent Resource Center clients, to virtual older adult programs, technology training, caregiver services, workshops, and support groups. In addition, NYC Aging surveyed foster grandparents to determine who needed a tablet in order to regularly participate in trainings and volunteer opportunities. As such, NYC Aging is in the process of providing tablets to an additional 270 foster grandparents to support virtual programming initiatives for both training and volunteer work with youth through the Foster Grandparent Program. This is funded through the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and again, the Foster Grandparent in this case, grant. Since March, providers have, let, have had to transition many programs, which normally are offered in person to virtual or telephone-based services. Our providers are now offering more than three times the virtual programs to older adults than was the case before the start of the pandemic. Older adult centers, many of which offered some virtual programming, pivoted quickly in order to increase virtual program offerings in areas such as social engagement programs that help keep older adults active and socially connected. A total of 242 older adult centers in our network, the vast majority of our centers, are now offering an array of free programs that include fitness classes, arts and crafts, music, and socialization programs online via Zoom. About 3,000 virtual programming events were offered through October 2020, and they involved more than 78,000 attendees. As a result, 
older adults now have a wider range of options and fewer barriers to attend. Centers are providing virtual programming in English, Spanish, Chinese, Italian, Russian, French, Polish, Korean, Arabic, Albanian, German, Greek, Lithu Lithuanian, Tagalog, and Yiddish. Over the last year, NYC Aging and our providers have also transitioned other programs and services to be virtual or telephone-based. These include friendly visiting, geriatric mental health, caregiver support, case management, and high-cap Medicare webinars and the development of new programming such as fraud prevention and empowerment series through our elder justice group. Virtual programs provide older adults with flexibility to join when they can and not have it interfere with their schedules. It fosters community, connection, wellness, and intellectual, creative, and physical engagement. We have increasingly seen the value in this delivery method and are working on ways to ensure that virtual programming continues post COVID to provide older adults with more choices and flexibility. Additionally, NYC Aging has long had a friendly visiting program in which volunteers visited older matches in their home. This program shifted to virtual check-ins in March. In October, we launched Friendly Voices meaning virtual opportunities, improving connections with elders, which is based on the friendly visiting program model. However, it is, a, it is designed to be virtual, even after the pandemic is over. Friendly Voices is also available to all older adults who are socially isolated. Friendly Voices offers the option to have a peer-to-peer -peer match or the ability to join small virtual groups. In conclusion, We'd like to say the pandemic has really highlighted the digital divide and the need for this work to be a continued priority. We have learned from providers work that virtual programming can be used to convey important information to older adults about benefits critical to their well-being, as well as other social services. Technology can be used to combat social isolation through friendly visiting and caregiver support and can be used to promote good mental health and to stay engaged and connected. It can be leveraged for exercise and nutrition information to help achieve and maintain good physical health. While many programs were offered virtually prior to the pandemic, we will continue to support increased options going forward and expect that they will remain an integral part of programming even after the pandemic has ended. Through our work with the Mayor's Office of the Chief Technology Officer, we are considering and identifying opportunities to expand on the resources already available to achieve the full potential of this remarkable pathway for communication of information and for engagement and support. We look forward to continuing our partnerships to evaluate ways to increase access to devices, connectivity, and training for especially lower income people to increase their ability to make use of such offerings. As always, we are grateful to the chairs and the committees for your advocacy and continued partnership to support our older New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We will now turn to Chair Chen for questions. Learning how to use technology. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, and you have heard from the providers earlier and some other council members' question. Um, it's difficult collecting data on how many seniors are actually participating um, in these virtual programs because you talk about, you know, there's all these thousands of programs that's been offered. Are, are you collecting like the daily um, attendance and to show like how many of the, the senior center members are actually participating in these programs? Yes, we are collecting that data. Um, Caitlin mentioned in her, test, uh, in her conversation with you uh, STARS, which is the client tracking system at the Department for the Aging. 
and um, we've been using STARS so that our providers can enter data on who's attending so that we can see those patterns over time and how they've been changing. So do you, can you share some of that data with us? Right, you know, the information that we shared today was that we've had um, between March when the pandemic uh, uh, really took hold and October, we had about 3000 different events virtually through our provider agencies and 78,000 attendees. So that was data through March. Now we're updating that data and we can certainly share the updated data with you. That will come, come through shortly. So what percentage of that um, compared to before, um, you know, participant who, who actually was able, you know, when the senior centers were open. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, every year we have about 165,000 different um, uh, older people attend a senior center. Um, only a portion of them choose to do the kinds of activities that you'd have on virtual programming. So when we're analyzing this data, the updated analysis that I mentioned to you that we're doing right now, we'll uh, be comparing the patterns of usage now with the patterns when the senior centers were open. But we're reaching a large uh, percentage of older people who compared to who was attending before the pandemic. I mean, yeah. just looking, yeah, just looking at the number briefly, it's only, it only looked like 50% participate in these programs and a large number of seniors actually are not taking advantage or cannot participate in these programs. Right. Because the senior centers are not open. So we're, we're besides, you know, getting wellness calls, uh, which is great, but they're not really actively engaged in, in the programs. I mean, when you talk about 78,000 compared to 165,000. Mm -hmm. Just right? one. Yes, I understand. And we have definitely shared, you know, the concern of uh, providers of the council about reaching uh, as many older people as we can. So we've uh, been emphasizing that throughout the uh, pandemic. And um, not everybody will want to attend uh, a certain event at a senior center or to attend virtual programming. We expect that when we update the data through this month, the number will be significantly larger because you might have heard from our testimony that the number has been increasing of senior centers participating. When Commissioner Cortez Vasquez uh, testified at a hearing that you chaired, uh, 171 programs were participating, now 242. So it's constantly growing. And I expect that number to be much larger when we analyze it today. And then of course, there are the other kinds of outreach we do to our members, uh, which we could speak about today as well, if you like. It, it's your 78,000 participant. Uh, I mean, the number, are they, um, they're not duplicated, like not, it's individual and not just participant. Like I, I could attend five of these programs. So do I get counted five times? Yes, these are unduplicated. Unduplicated, now. okay. That, that's good to know. Um, I know that we, Caitlin also talked about, you know, the budget and council member Rose asked about, you know, some centers were having problem with, you know, transferring funds to, to get these uh, tablets or whatever. Um, the uh, Senior Center RFP, uh, will that include uh, funding available for technology? Right, um, two things that I would say. Uh, one is that uh, our commissioner has been hosting, uh, envisioning the Senior Center of the Future uh, sessions with our providers and we've had stakeholder sessions related to the uh, RFP. And Caitlin's point about having flexibility on making use of the funds in their budget so that you can shift them where they're needed was one of the major points that people have raised. So we're definitely paying a lot of attention to that point as we structure the RFP, allowing for maximum flex flexibility in using funds. Um, there are some unspent monies 
that we think by allowing that flexibility, we'll make sure that uh, uh, we're spending maximally the available dollars. So that's one uh, advantage of the RFP, we think. Um, and as far as uh, using uh, some of those funds for uh, devices, I wanted to ask our associate commissioner, Guillermo Cruz, to address devices and uh, senior centers. Uh, Guillermo Cruz, our associate commissioner for the Bureau of Community Services, oversees community-based programs, including senior centers. I don't know, Guillermo, if you'd like to add something to the question. Yeah, just that I, I think that the uh, department um, is very much aware of this issue and is very much um, uh, aware of the need for more access um, by the seniors. And um, we are working with MOCTO to, um, to look at that. Uh, 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 we're looking at that particular issue um, collaboratively uh, with them um, with respect to um, the individual request. The department really is looking at it in a systematic way to to increase um, um, this uh, access by um, by senior sensors, it's because it's not only a question of um, the tablets; uh, it's also a question of the broadband access, and then also it's a question of support. Um, you know, the uh, delivery of the equipment is not enough in many, in most cases. Um, the senior really needs support in many cases to learn how to use the device and feel comfortable um, uh, taking advantage of the equipment that we have. Well, I guess related to that is that, you know, with the new RFP, um, there's got to be increased funding in there uh, to provide for this component. Um, and that also go to this year's budget, whether or not, you know, when we talk about um, the, uh, the 10 million that was supposed to be in the budget, uh, last year disappear. <laughs> uh, so we got to get that back and also the indirect costs that, you know, Caitlin was talking about earlier, that got to be sufficient funding because the technology component is, is going to be a, an important component for the senior and more seniors will participate uh, in our center. Um, and then I think the, one of the earlier uh, question or comments was about you know, the computer rooms uh, in the senior center um, are very needed because a lot of seniors, that's how they learn and that's how they, uh, you know, were able to um, do emails and access because they don't have it at home. So it's stiff to actively kind of planning on this because there will be money coming from the federal government and then the governor talking about, you know, offering uh, programs for, um, you know, a low cost, brought that. It, it's uh, just actively, you know, coordinating uh, with other agencies and, and really planning how to make sure that this funding uh, is going to be available to help our seniors uh, get broadband access, you know, computers, so that we don't miss out because a lot of these are first come first serve. Yeah, I want to mention a couple of things related to that. One is, of course, we're really pleased with what we've been able to accomplish with our provider partners and our sister agencies to date uh, related to uh, virtual programming and other forms of online access. Um, there have been real gains with the funding that we do have, and we're very, very pleased by that. Um, and certainly, if more resources became available, um, we uh, would uh, implement more programming in the most effective ways possible. In the meantime, just as you're uh, alluding to, Chair Chen, we uh, are always in conversation with our sister agencies about optimal ways to utilize the funding that is available now. And uh, that led to some of the programming that we already put in place that several of us have mentioned today. But there are ongoing conversations, for example, that DIFTA has with MOPTO and others about where we might go depending on available resources and uh, equally important with the resources that we have available now. So what is that? I know we had earlier conversation about the problem of getting appointments uh, for vaccine and centers been, you know, calling seniors and we had this whole conversation uh, today about 
what's the plan of getting um, the senior center open so that they could be uh, a place where the seniors could just get their vaccines uh, and also uh, the providers of Norx uh, and also senior building. Is DIFTA working actively uh, to do that? Because that would make the most sense because that's what the, the seniors are. And the, the issue is that when you get the vaccine, it's two dose. So right after you get your first dose, you got to come back and get your second dose in two, three weeks. Uh, so is DIFTA actively working um, with the vaccination act, uh, action center, whatever we call it, um, to work on using our senior centers and our senior buildings and our NORCs to provide um, the vaccine? Yes, um, in, a, in several ways. First of all, our commissioner is a member of the working group established by the mayor concerning uh, the vaccine programming at this time for older New Yorkers, focused on older New Yorkers. So lots of discussion, lots of um, planning through the working group that our commissioner is on. And also staff are very closely tied to the uh, vaccine command center that's been set up so that there are always conversations there. Um, in terms of uh, making senior centers available as sites, we're at a, as I think we all know, uh, we're at a very difficult point at the moment because um, there is such demand for the vaccinations uh, when the age was lowered from 75 to 65 for vaccinations, which of course we were very pleased by, that's hugely important, but that more than doubled the number of older people uh, eligible for the vaccine. And that equals about 1.3 million people. That's a huge number. And that um, lowering from 75 to 65 by the governor happened almost overnight. And there's a bit of a perfect storm because that happened at the same time that uh, the uh, distribution of vaccines from the federal government was really drying up. And so we're really hoping that there's going to be a major increase in vaccine made available, available by the federal government. Uh, we don't think this is a good moment at this exact time to be opening senior centers for vac vaccination when there just is not vaccine available. As we know, the mayor was talking about how we're going to be running out of vaccine uh, momentarily. Uh, and again, we're hoping the federal government is going to completely change its pathway now uh, for getting vac vaccines to us. And with that flow, we certainly will be considering, along with the mayor's uh, working group, uh, um, uh, opening additional sites, including senior centers. So we'll have to see how that proceeds. But we do have well, that in mind. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to have it in mind. I mean, I think it's like, we got to do the preparation because I reach out, you know, to the commissioner early on. And I think the commissioner um, agree with me that we got to get the centers open. First of all, even to provide the food, right? The centers are ready, but they need the guidance and they need the resources. Uh -huh. So what, I mean, it's like, we can't be continue to plan, plan, plan. We got to things, get the things in motion, I mean, we knew the vaccine was coming, uh, even though we don't have it now, but do we have a plan in place? How to safely open up the centers, you know, work with the providers, get the guidance out there and get get ready, right? Uh, because right now they're the one that's making the calls uh, to the seniors. So we just don't see the urgency. I mean, like the whole talk about reopening the center, maybe we could do the food because the Get Food program is not the best for our seniors. Our senior centers know how to prepare, you know, well nutritious, culturally sensitive meals. And we said that we know, you know, but how do we safely do that? You know, let's let's work it, plan it out, and then we can also utilize them to do the vaccination. I mean, we we Councilman Maiello was telling me that one of the senior building um, in her district was able to do a vaccination for like my 200 seniors. And it's like, it's possible you, you do it right. 
But then versus an Anitra building where they didn't do it right, they didn't reach the seniors. I mean, so it's a waste of the vaccine. So like, we just got to like plan, work with the provider and start doing it. Um, at the same time, we will advocate for more vaccine, but we have the infrastructure. Let's utilize those infrastructure, uh, the senior centers and, and the norks and the senior building that the city, you know, the city know who they are and can really utilize them to help. Yes, I do just want to mention again, we absolutely share your concern about this and planning is actively underway and can be stepped up quickly um, as we proceed. Getting the vaccine is crucial and advocacy around that is important. And we uh, uh, very much would like to work with uh, the city council on advocating for, um, you know, federal distribution, et cetera. We do think that the plan being put forth by the current new administration federally will be of an enormous help very quickly. Okay. Um, I, I don't want to take up that much time. I'm going to pass it over uh, to Chair Holden and then other council member uh, who have questions and I can always come back. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Chen. Um, thank you, Deputy Commissioner, for your testimony. Uh, a few questions, because um, uh, I'm puzzled. Uh, we knew the vaccine was coming months, months ago. Uh, we knew we would have the vaccine in place. Yet, um, when this administration rolled out um, 1A, uh, the level of 1A for vaccine, um, there was a lot of things missing. Um, first of all, even when it was uh, 75 and over um, that, that could get vaccinated, there wasn't even a, uh, a phone line set up to, to, to make appointments. That, that took a few days to, to actually have people set up on the phones. We, so we, and then we have a, a website on the health and hospitals and also nyc.gov. That's an absolute joke for seniors especially, or much less anybody, uh, making an appointment. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just puzzled by some of, you know, you said the commissioner is a member of the working group. Well, what's the plan here? Uh, you said, well, maybe the, there's, there's not enough vaccine uh, to go around right now. Yes, but there may be next week, right? There may be enough vaccine next week in place to vaccinate the population, the senior, the, the eligible po population. Yet, we still don't have a, a, a workable plan in place to reach seniors. Do you think that we're reaching the seniors? Because the seniors in my district, and I think every council member can tell you, we're getting, we're getting calls from almost um, across the board from seniors who can't make appointments. So there should be a comprehensive plan, Deputy Commissioner, right now, not next week, not three months from now, because our seniors are the most vulnerable. So there should be a place now that you should say, you know what, when we get the vaccines, we're opening up the senior centers, we're going to vaccinate there starting you know, with that, and we're going to do it right away. Um, I don't know how many senior centers I don't think have, you've reached out to yet to do that. Have you reached out to any senior centers to set up the vaccine distribution? Uh, I'd like to just mention, uh, obviously today the uh, uh, hearing was focused on technology. So we came to really talk about technology. So I don't have a lot of uh, information and detail about vaccine processes themselves. I mean, we certainly appreciate the question that you're raising on this and we are actively involved in very quickly planning and meeting the needs of older people related to the uh, 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 vaccine issue and doing lots of work with seniors right now. Um, one thing we didn't mention was that we uh, are making, we mentioned in the testimony that we've made 2.9 million calls to people. We've pivoted all of that work and that infrastructure in our system to connecting with older people about uh, the vaccine issues to guide them. So right now, every day, 
uh, many, many calls are being made uh, to older people by DIFTA and our partners to help assist them in getting access to vaccines and dealing with some of the issues that you and others on the council and people testifying today have raised. So we do have that program in place. And I know, but it's just more that conversation. Here's what I'm hearing. Conversations are taking place. You know, we've made two, two million calls. Uh, were those robo calls, by the way? No, those were calls. Those were calls. Uh, actually, people actually reached out. Okay. So the calls were made. Um, again, I'm hearing that the seniors are not getting access to the vaccine or they don't know when they're going to get access to the vaccine. So I, let's, you mentioned that this is about technology uh, that this hearing was about. So what, what, is, what are DIFTA's recommendations to improve the technology to uh, reach our seniors other than giving, you know, uh, talking about uh, laptops and, or, or I'm sorry, uh, iPads, but what right now to get the vaccine in the arms of our seniors, what is DIFTA's plan for the coming weeks? Uh, like I mentioned, do you have a comprehensive plan um, to reach out? And, then, and technology is important, obviously, but we know the limitations of our seniors at this point. We can't just say, you know, by osmosis, say, all right, we're going to, we have the technology ready to go to help our seniors. It doesn't exist right now. Um, so there has to be plan B. And your commissioner is on this working group. Uh, why didn't the commissioner, I, I'm sure that the commissioner mentioned, you know what, the, you know, these, do, doing this website is not going to reach our seniors. So what's plan B? Well, by phone. That wasn't set up initially. That took days to set up the phone calls for at least where see people without access to the internet, without access to broadband, could make appointments. Um, that wasn't set up initially. So either the administration is not, li not listening to your commissioner or it's just not trickling down to the right places. Um, has your office worked with the CTO to, to uh, remedy some of these uh, situations? Right, um, two things. One is that uh, you know we work very closely with the Vaccine Command Center and uh, follow uh, their lead in terms of uh, a number of these issues you're raising so that uh, we work with them on those issues. Um, we do have with us today, Kate Holman, who might also be able to address your questions. Uh, Kate, would you like to do that? Sure, um, on the question of coordinating vaccines, uh, we're not currently involved in, in that effort uh, for the city. So unfortunately I don't have, and I, I'm aware that you did speak to our, our CTO, John Paul Farmer about this larger set of questions on Tuesday. I don't have any updated information to what he shared at that time, uh, but I'm happy to relay. I'd like to, uh, just thought, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'd, I'd like to, because you know, uh, the CTO has done a great job uh, and, I, and I admire him. Um, uh, but I'd like to know that some of our, you know, hearings are yielding results. Like, I, do you know if anybody's working on improving the, the site? Do you know if, because if seniors obviously are left out of that, many seniors, and you heard the numbers today, that many seniors are left out of, you know, uh, getting online. Uh, many of them don't have email addresses. So the plan then has to be uh, either, you know, your office or, um, do it or somebody uh, comes up with, yeah, we're going to, we have to upgrade this. And these are the steps we're taking to improve the online experience for everyone and including seniors. Do, do, we don't have that yet, right? Yeah, I appreciate that concern. As I said, I, I, unfortunately, I don't have an update to what the CTO shared with you on Tuesday, but I'm happy to relay back your eagerness to hear more. Okay, back, I guess it's back to Deputy Commissioner uh, uh, Bosnick. So, what is the plan to improve, you know, how do we reach seniors with technology um, or improve that website? Again, you know, I am not uh, prepared to really talk about that today, the specific vaccine website. We can certainly, uh, we absolutely hear your concern, uh, 
Mr. Council Chair, and we're happy to talk with uh, VCC and the work group, and all of us have a real sense of urgency around this, so um, we'll follow up with conversations with them, but we followed their lead with the vaccine. One thing I wanted to mention uh, is that I don't think others have mentioned today. Um, we know from your uh, information and from our testimony today and from the uh, people who testified before the administration that um, not everybody has easy access to online resources, especially people of low income. Uh, we're very concerned about that. So I do want to remind us that there is a uh, telephone number that people can use to um, be connected as well. That's very, very important, I think, for everybody to be aware of uh, 1-877-VAX, V-A-X, for the number NYC. Um, so we're really trying to make people aware of the fact that if there are difficulties or if you simply don't have access, call that number. And um, if people are hearing about any difficulties with that number, um, uh, it's important to, I think, let uh, the VCC know that, but um, it's a very important resource for people who cannot go online. I, I just got to jump in a little bit. I, I, I'm really a little frustrated um, that, I mean, DIFTA is the agency that's designated to work with, to help our seniors, right? To take care of our seniors. And it's like, there's no coordination. And then like, this is the chief technology officer. There's no coordination in putting out the website. I mean, language access in different languages, come on. Not everybody is proficient in English. And then when you talk about spending so much time on the phone, the hotline, there's problem with the hotline too, with language access. So it's kind of like there is no, I don't see the coordination and I don't see, you know, the urgency. I mean, I have so many complaints from my constituents who are seniors, who have health issue, who have trouble, um, you know, getting an appointment, you you expect someone who is not proficient in English to navigate all those pages, or you gotta get somebody to help you. It's like why why is the application so long? Why don't we why couldn't we make it easier? Right? I mean it's like the website, it's Department of Health, but who's helping them? I mean, it's kind of like we have the technology chief technology officer. I, I see your job or what the that office job is to really help make sure these websites are operating before you announce the program. I mean, the frustration that seniors are getting, even my own brother was like screaming at me, like, what's wrong with you guys? You can't, you know, get it right. Uh, why am I so difficult to get an appointment? Uh, so there's got to be some urgency there. Deputy Commissioner, DIPTA, right? We should be advocating and saying, making sure our seniors get those vaccines and get the appointment. Even when now you're asking providers to make the calls, I mean, and then some of the providers have to help. And we heard earlier, it also take them a long time to help the senior to get an appointment. And a lot of times the appointment is not where the, it's not close to where the senior lives. I know the city say, oh, we're working on providing transportation. It's just so complicated. Simplify, use the senior center, use the senior building, use the norm. And that's DIFTA's job to advocate for that. And, right? I, do, I, and I do want to mention, when you say advocate, advocate, we very much share, I think the administration overall shares the sense of urgency around vaccination. Um, working really intensively around that. Uh, we're active consultants with uh, the working group, with the vaccine uh, command center in trying to make sure uh, that the process works as quickly as possible. But it is the vaccine command center, uh, which is uh, um, coordinating this work. And I think they could better respond to some of the specifics of what we're raising today. We're consultants to that process, as I mentioned. So certainly uh, we will uh, discuss all of the things that you and 
and council colleagues have raised today with them um, uh, as we continue with this uh, urgent effort. Um, I do wanna remind us that while working in that consulting role with uh, the Vaccine Control Center and with the working group, we're also talking every day with many, many people, uh, older people about the vaccine one-on-one -on -one, uh, about all the issues of going online and helping them to get online and get their appointment and then to also deal with transportation issues if those issues arise. So that work is happening each and every day and we set that up very, very quickly because we agree with you concerning the urgency of this issue. So DIFTA actually has already reached out to all the, the senior center and, and senior services provider um, to, to start making those calls and doing that. Yes. I mean, I'm not... It's so important what you just said, uh, uh, Council Chair for Aging. Um, we have really pivoted completely from broader wellness calls that we have been making each week. That's the 2.9 million calls I mentioned, but we have completely pivoted for the moment because we see the absolute urgency of this issue. We've totally pivoted to making calls about the vaccine. Now, of course, when we make the call, the calls if people have other issues, we're there to help them with that as well. But the number one issue that we're focused on right now and that all the calls are centered on and that we're doing with all of our provider partners, of course, hundreds of different contracts, uh, centers around the vaccine, talking with the people about the vaccine, how to get it, how to schedule an appointment, helping them make sure that that appointment is scheduled. All of that's happening right now. You know, my last point is that I don't want to see what happened with the Get Food program happen with the vaccine, okay? Because seniors are having so much problem, um, you know, with this whole Get Food, Get Food Star and, and all that, while the, the senior center, you know, then last minute get, you know, got to say, oh, now you, you got to help the senior connect to this Get Food program. I mean, it, it seems like the whole thing is happening again, and I want, just want to make sure that the, the va vaccine command center know that this is a priority and we've been advocating with them and I've spoken to, to them about it, that you know the seniors utilize the infrastructure that we have now. Uh, I don't want what happened with the Get Food program. Uh, the, the same thing, it's the same problem with the vaccine. Uh, Chair Holden, I turn it back to you. Uh, I'm, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm very frustrated. Um, I, I'm frustrated with DIFTA. Because you, I, I'm going back to this, um, we have seniors now 65 and over, before it was 75 and over, that was eligible to get vaccinated. Um, yet DIFTA can't tell me because they said, well, this is not really the topic of the hearing. Well, the topic of the hearing was tech for seniors and how to prepare to, you know, to get the vaccine and how we can help them and so forth and so on. So this is not off topic that you shouldn't have, you, you can't tell us What's the master plan from DIFTA to help seniors gain access to this vaccine? That should be like number one priority. Yeah, you can reach out to 2 million seniors, but if there, we have to have a plan to open up senior centers for the vaccine. Is, is that a priority of DIFTA, to open up the senior centers to help with the vaccine? Did you tell the mayor's office and, and the, uh, the command center that, that's a priority because we're not we're not giving the, the seniors the vaccine in numbers that we need to do because they are the most vulnerable. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, opening sites, including senior centers, we think is a good idea. We're not opening them at the moment this week because to open sites additionally without uh, any vaccine available is not a good idea. We're hoping okay, that- so, so yeah. I, I, I posed that question before. Let's say next week we have enough vaccine. We did have, remember we did have enough vaccines and we weren't, we, uh, this administration took Christmas day off from vaccinating people and took New Year's off from vaccinating people. That's how urgent this is to them and, and the Department of Health. They took those two days off. 
and vaccinated maybe 100 people out of the city of 8.5 million. This is, this is the mentality of this administration. And I'm not sensing an urgency. I am outraged, by the way, because personally, my mom's in a nursing home, right? 96 years old. The nursing home, this is in December, got the vaccine. They just didn't want to vaccinate every member of that nursing home. They only vaccinated the long-term members um, who were there. That means my mom was only there a couple of months. That wasn't long enough for them to vaccinate. So guess what? My mom wasn't vaccinated. There's an outbreak in the nursing home. Uh, 24 patients got COVID. And now my mom's the 25th. She's got COVID. She's in the hospital. Because the, the rollout of this administration did not really prioritize seniors. And uh, DIFTA should have a master plan that if we got you know, a million doses next week, we open up all the senior centers and they vaccinate. But I haven't heard that today. Because that's, the, that's what you heard senior center, uh, the senior center that we heard today, and I'm hearing from all my seniors, they could do it. So it's outrageous that, and for, first of all, even your answer on the, uh, the budget for the senior centers, that, that a year into the pandemic, we can't pivot so they could spend some of their money on technology to, to reach the seniors. I mean, that's outrageous. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm just puzzled by you know, a lot of the answers here that I need, uh, we need DIFTA to really take a lead role here. And if the mayor's not listening, then we have to make them listen because our seniors are being left out and our seniors are, are dying, dying you know, every day because the vaccine is not getting in, into their arms quick enough. And, and just relying on, on a horrible website that's nothing more than a glorified store locator and seniors are hitting their heads against the wall trying to, to schedule is outrageous. And, and all the phone calls you make are not gonna you know, get, us, um, get us senior um, uh, appointments. I'll turn it back to you, Chair, because uh, I, I'm just frustrated. Uh, we're not gonna get anywhere if we're gonna take this, uh, we're not getting the answers today from DIFTA at all. And the, the fact that the CTO in his defense, the CTO's office, by the way, was not asked to participate in, in uh, the rollout of this website or anything else. And neither was really essentially do it. And we found that out. So the mayor's office is not reaching out to the, to, to the people they have that can solve this problem. They have the, the technical people, they have the designers that could, that could upgrade this website, that could reach a lot of people. Um, but you're hearing from DIFTA, they don't really have a plan to reach senior centers with the vaccine, or at least they won't tell us. And that's another, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of hitting a dead end. I'll turn it back to you, Chair, because uh, um, I'm, we're getting nowhere. Okay. Well, we got to have, a, we got to have another hearing um, in the beginning of February, which is going to be focused. Uh, and it's a joint hearing with the health committee. It's going to be focused on this. And I hope by then uh, you will have all the answers related uh, to the plan of opening senior centers, Norwalk's building, and how do we get the vaccine to the seniors? And hopefully by then, uh, the plan's in place and we already started doing that. Um, Chair, Chair Chin, yes. um, this is, um, I'm Guillermo Cruz at, um, at DIFTA. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that, um, first of all, I wanted to communicate that there is an urgency about that. We have definitely at DIFTA reviewed um, our senior center sites, our NORC sites, um, there are requirements that we looked at. There are requirements for um, size, square footage. There are requirements for refrigeration, electricity. Um, we, we have um, uh, 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 conducted a very in-depth review of our senior center facilities, um, all sites, whether NYCHA, whether um, City fund, uh, city owned, or city leased, um, or or privately owned, um, and have um, done an extensive review and have forwarded that information to the vaccine uh, command center. Um, so it's definitely an active concern, as you mentioned earlier in in uh, in this hearing. Um, a number of NYCHA sites, um, including senior centers, have already been. Um, participating, you know, uh, Cassidy Coles, as you mentioned, Van Dyke, Polo Grounds, um, and I think there are more. I think 
I think the big issue is supply, and that's going to be a federal, that's really a federal issue as I understand it. So I just wanted to make sure that- Mr. Mr. Cruz, if I might, let's say, uh, let's put aside the supply because you have to prepare that the supply will be there. You have to prepare for that. So how many, how many senior centers have you reached out to? Did you reach out to all, you know, a few hundred of them or how many? We, re we reviewed all, all, um, all the specifications of different site facilities. So, um, you know, we have 249 centers. Some of them are, are more likely to, to serve as a, as a, a point of, as a pod, as a point of, dis of dispensing the vaccine. And we have forwarded that information to um, the vaccine com uh, command center as, as Michael Bozic has mentioned that we are in close communication um, uh, and very collaborative with them. Um, so they, they have this information and um, would be able to um, uh, um, uh, turn on these, these sites as, um, and, and initiate these sites. Um, so they have this information. And it's, it's definitely, it's definitely a, 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 a very high concern for the department for the age. So how many, how many um, senior centers you think you could roll out the vaccine in um, by in two weeks, let's say? Well, we, we identified um, uh, around um, 100 sites um, that would meet the specifications um, for, uh, you know, for refrigeration, site facility um, uh, size. Um, so um, these sites have been identified as, um, as uh, uh, likely to be um, points of, of dispensing. Um, uh, or, or that meet these qualifications as, as, as um, uh, identified by the Vaccine Command Center. Because I'm going to reach out to my senior centers, and I have a, a bunch, and I want to see if they're, because you know, they're very large, and if we're just talking about a freezer, I think uh, DIFTA could provide freezers to the senior centers, um, and um, if we provide the medical staff to do this, I mean, this seems like a no-brainer. So if, if I think all of the senior centers, at least the vast majority, should be um, mobilized, and there has to be a master plan. Now, I'm not hearing that, um, and I, I hope you you know I hope that you reached out to areas that don't have transportation, uh, where seniors uh, have to they can walk to the center. But in my district, I have very little options on public transportation. I don't have I didn't have testing sites in my district, um, and I don't have vaccine sites in my district. Uh, and yet, my se I have a large senior population. So I just think I want to make sure that you're reaching out to all the senior centers. And if they're not, you think they're not eligible, that they, you, we make them eligible. We make them um, really uh, give them the, the freezers, give them the necessary people to, to, uh, to mobilize this. That's what it takes. It's a wartime effort here against the pandemic. And we have to, be, we have, to have some sense of urgency. Thank you, Chair. I'm sorry, Ben. Yeah, no, I mean, I, it's, I'm glad to hear that they're, you know, that you're working on it and you survey, you know, all the centers, but I think it will be good that you provide or get the, the vaccination command center to provide that information, what is needed, and give that to every uh, senior centers and the senior buildings in the north and see, you know, how you work together to make sure that those facilities have, have what they need. To do the vaccination, I mean, as I talk, I mean, I, Council Member Ayala uh, has a question, but she's the one that gave me the example how one senior building already done it. So it was like it, it, it should not be that difficult, and I think we should be well prepared, making sure that the centers and the building have the resources. So once we get the vaccine, they're ready to go, and that's what we want to, you know, to hear that's that Dipter is actively taking a role with the vaccine command center. And it should not be just, you know, advising. I want to make sure that the commissioner, I mean, if we need to back her up, we'll back her up. Because like, I don't want to see what happened with the Get Food program happen again. Uh, so I'm going to pass it on to, uh, to other council members. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we have Council Member Ayala followed by Council Member Rose. 
Councilman Brayala. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm gonna just to follow up on that. Um, I think that while we wait for next month's hearing and we're preparing for more doses to become available, that we should be utilizing this time very strategically to educate the older adult population on the benefits of uh, vaccinating. I think that this is a, a real concern in communities of color. There's a lot of misinformation that is that is uh, being spread across our communities. And I think that the fact that, you know, we do have some seniors that are connected virtually should uh, allow us a window into, you know, to uh, into their homes and allow us an opportunity to really connect with them um, differently. I remember many years ago when I used to when I used to run a, a senior center at a, the Casita Maria Senior Center, we were invited to um, participate in an open house for a senior center in a more affluent community. And I remember getting there, and there was a uh, there was a workshop. I could I, I would I could hear the the woman speaking in a very low tone, and she was singing a song um, from the musical The Sound of Music. And it was a yoga class that was being done on over uh, to, over the phone, right? So we know that you know we have so many uh, seniors that are homebound. Um, this is a, this is I think we need to learn lessons, right? This is an opportunity for us to really rethink how we connect with people, older adults, with children, with families. Um, you know, it, it's this kind of like a redo. Um, and if we don't take advantage of these lessons, then we're missing, you know, we're missing the mark here. So um, I think, you know, one, I would suggest that, you know, there be better coordination between DIFTA and, and the local uh, senior centers to try to come up with uh, programming um, opportunities and maybe invite um, local doctors to come in and speak to, you know, host webinars uh, with our older adult population to make sure that we're getting information as we're preparing. Um, and I hope to see, you know, again, I hope to see uh, a bigger effort made um, towards really securing the, the funding necessary um, to revamp our technology uh, systems at the local uh, senior centers. Because I think that, again, there's a real opportunity to connect and most specifically with seniors who are homebound and socially isolated. I'm not sure if, you know, if DIFTA's given any thought to this um, or if, you know, we're just kind of, you know, living day by day and just checking the box and saying, you know, we had an event and, you know, 10 seniors showed up, we're good. Um, or if there's a, a, a bigger, you know, more comprehensive um, thought process behind how we can utilize this experience and the lessons learned to make, you know, um, the senior center experience better for, you know, more generations of older adults. Right, I just want to mention related to that, uh, we have been talking about the lessons that we can learn from this pandemic uh, uh, each and every day and various initiatives and various steps that we're taking come from observing what has happened and learning from that quickly. Um, the uh, NYCHA tablet project was uh, one initiative that came about as a result of seeing just how valuable and important all of this is and connecting 10,000 NYCHA residents and their families uh, as a result of uh, this tablet project. I also wanted to um, ask Kate um, to talk a little bit about connected communities because Council Member Ayala, when you're talking about what have you learned and how can we reach people, one of the major uh, efforts is uh, connected communities. So I did want Kate to have a moment to share that with everybody. Sure. So um, the Connected Communities program is a longstanding program that we have um, been overseeing for many years. Uh, we partner with DIFTA on that program, as well as with all three library systems, the Parks Department and NYCHA. And this is a program to support um, public computer centers across the city that are managed by those partner entities. Um, and to ensure that New Yorkers across the city have that social and technical support and that training available in their communities. Um, we provide some funding to all of those agencies through the program to boost resources in high need areas and facilities. Um, and we also do some citywide coordination through that program um, across the city. The city has over 500 of these public computer centers um, that you know generally offer over 2,500 hours per week of digital literacy training. So it's a large system and we do some coordination work um, across that system as well. 
Thank you. Um, it, it, Madam Chair, if you allow me one more question. I just, so my concern has always been <clears throat> really related to, how, you know, we, we know that, you know, I'm expired. we know that the digital divide exists, right? Um, it exists in the older adult population as well. However, there are seniors that are connected. My concern is that if a senior center is hosting, you know, events, right, and they're trying to transition to virtual um, programming, and three people are showing up, then that is not working, right? So who is responsible then for saying, you know what, this is not working, we need to try a different approach, maybe it's the type, you know, are, are we following it up with a call? How are we engaging with those older adults and encouraging them to use this as an opportunity to really socialize with their peers? Right, um, two things, and then Guillermo, if you have anything you'd like to add um, that I would mention is, first of all, in terms of that digital divide, I don't wanna lose sight of the larger issue, which is that, especially given the city's current fiscal situation, um, it's very, very important to think in terms of the state and federal governments and investments needed. The, uh, that digital divide, as we all know from the data that we've talked about today is really, really large. And no one city can uh, bridge that divide on its own. So we definitely uh, appreciate your partnership and would like to see ways that we could work together uh, with the council on uh, frankly lobbying Albany and DC to um, fund expanded access to technology. So that's one point that we actually wanted to make today. So I'm very pleased Council Member Ayala, Ayala, that you raised uh, the digital divide and how to uh, uh, bridge that. There are definitely things we can do locally um, and are doing locally, um, uh, but we have to have more state and federal support. So we'd like to join with you in that. Um, and then in terms of uh, programming, um, Kate mentioned uh, connected um, communities. Um, I wanted to mention, and uh, hopefully uh, Guillermo can spend a moment talking about our work with OATS because you made a very important point about uh, connections to homebound people and making people aware, absolutely hugely important. And we've had a relationship with OATS, uh, older adult technology services since 2013 with funding to them uh, to deal with some of the issues you raised. And we didn't have much time to talk about that today. And I was hoping that Guillermo could take a moment to talk about our two different contracts with OATS and what we've been doing with them to address some of the issues that you raised. Right, so we, we have currently two um, uh, contracts with OATS. One um, was the, the support um, that was mentioned for the 10,000 uh, 10, tablets, because that's going, that contract runs to, through June 30th of this year. Um, and, you know, I, it's um, really to first, at first, when the, when the seniors first got the tablets, um, they did outreach, they, they, they outreached to all the seniors to make sure they got the, the tablets. Um, and then they have um, really a, a sort of a multifaceted approach to um, supporting them. So everything from a hotline, um, from uh, virtual trainings, um, and then as, and then also of course uh, T-Mobile, who su who supplied the um, uh, the the tablets, also has a customer um, uh, uh, a customer uh, a helpline, um, so that. OATS has been very involved. It, it, as you know, as I mentioned before, it's really important not just to get the technology um, to the clients, but it's also to support them so that they know how to use it, that they can enjoy and have full usage of um, the tablets that um, they receive. Um, the other, um, the other OATS contract we had. Um, has been one since um, 2013, um, connected New York City connected communities. Um, and that um, has been um, housed um, uh, in, in 22 different, usually 22, uh, recently 22 different sites. Um, we make sure that there's a representation of low income sites. There's some NYCHA sites there too. Um, and again, there, they, um, they provide all kinds of training to, to uh, seniors. 
Um, they also um, they also host a really great website, the Senior Planet Exploration Site, which um, is really geared for uh, seniors. Gives them all kinds of tips. Gives them information. Um, if you visit the site, it's so upbeat. It makes you it makes you feel good about being a senior. It's really well planned, well executed. Um, so that OATS has been very key. And also um, their, their trainings are multilingual, I believe in five languages. Um, so they have been incredible. And then of course, um, what used to be congregate or on-site services, they pivoted to virtual um, programming and virtual services. So their reach to the senior centers is much broader. Um, but they've been very key in helping seniors get the technology, but also really use the technology and, and supporting them, um, supporting them so that um, they can use, use it for all the different um, uh, functions and all the different uh, aspects of, of accessing the internet and, and, and accessing um, online opportunities. So I just wanted to um, mentioned that uh, that uh, OATS has been very very key in in addressing that digital divide. Um, I was also gonna I was also gonna also mention back to another point uh, about educating the seniors. So um, you know, as as was mentioned, you know, first of all, the city is you know as, as we mentioned a few times, the city has been in close contact in close contact with um, the health department and the vaccine command center. I know that there was a mailer sent out to millions of, um, of New Yorkers, including, se including seniors that had information about eligibility, um, the vaccine finder website and the call center. Um, additionally, I know that there were robocalls made to, to seniors um, to give them information about um, vaccines. So there is, there is a large effort um, to get information about the vaccine, the safety of vaccine, um, educating seniors. Um, also, I think, uh, Michael, maybe you, uh, you can speak more about this. I, there was just recently a webinar this week um, that um, uh, a, a, a panel of different uh, um, scientists, um, uh, uh, representatives of, of uh, pharmaceuticals, um, the health department that provided um, information, um, education, um, educational information um, about the vaccine. Because as, as was mentioned, I believe you mentioned it, um, Council Member Ayala, that there's a lot of in, uh, misinformation and there's, um, there can be in certain communities distrust of, um, of the vaccine. So um, there's also an you know there's also an educational campaign. Um, yeah, and, you know, and I know that we're gonna have a we're gonna have a hearing about this next month, but you know it's it's really serious because then as I mentioned this to Council to Council Chair uh, Chin, um, you know I had the, the the benefit of attending two events this weekend, and one of them rolled out really nicely. We had a building with 300 units, uh, a little over 200 seniors signed up for, and you know got vaccinated, and then we have a night of development where you know, signs were posted, the vaccine is available tomorrow, come down. Um, and they were having a really hard time getting seniors to come. And I, I'm very familiar with, you know, uh, the seniors in that building. And I was making those phone calls and a lot of them didn't want to come down. Um, they didn't want to come down. And I think, you know, going back and asking the other building, well, what was, you know, what made this event so successful, right? Does the fact that the particip participation rate is so high is really because they took the time to connect with their older adults, to educate them and walk them through the process, to answer questions, right? To really demystify a lot of what they have been hearing, you know, um, from friends and and, and relatives, um, and that made for a really successful um, vaccination um, date. So I think that you know I look forward to that, but I just really wanted to hone in on the fact that you guys have the opportunity via you know technology to really get to hundreds of thousands of older adults throughout the city. And if we're not doing that properly, then that is, you know, really insane. And, you know, we should all ourselves because um, it's a new day. 
it's a new day and I think that you know we need to adjust thank right. you uh, madam chair for your time you've been very generous um I have to go to another hearing but this is really uh really a good hearing and I really look forward to follow up thank you council member Ayala to the rest of the council members I'd like to remind you that if you have any questions for this panel, please use the Zoom raise hand function. You have five minutes for your questions. And after I call on you, a sergeant at, Ar at arms will keep a timer and I we'll let you know when your time is up. If there are any other council members who have questions for the panel, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. Council member Rose. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to circle back uh, to the change in the purpose of funds in order to purchase laptops and tablets. Um, and just a short answer. Will DIFTA allow organizations to use their FY21 expense funds to purchase laptops and tablets for seniors? Just a yes or no is okay. Um, I am not sure the answer to that. I'd like to get back to you on that question. We will talk with uh, people at DIFTA and Fiscal and get back to you. Unless, Guillermo, you know the answer to that question. Otherwise, we'll get back to the council member. Um, I, th I, think, I, think it's, I think we'll get back to the, the council member on, on her question. I know also that uh, with respect to, uh, let's say, discretionary funds, the councilmatic funds, I think that um, there as I understand it, there would be difficulties. Let's say if 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 there were accruals or if there with with the councilmatic discretionary funds, um, using them for tablets, unless um, the purpose. Um, and I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not thinking of the actual terminology, but the the actual scope of the. Could you could you get back to me with an answer? Um, this is a, a question that uh, my organization. You know that's very important to my organizations yes absolutely we'll get thank back to you shortly on that okay um earlier thank you um earlier we heard from um miss alfreda Highland highland who talked about access and the high cost of broadband services um the emergency broadband benefit program which is a federal program um and it was passed in december 2020 um the larger broadband access agreement would invest $7 billion to increase access to broadband. Um, would this service help an individual like uh, Ms. Highland who doesn't meet the current financial um, criteria but lives on a fixed income? How many um, New York City seniors are participating in that program? What is the rollout time? And is this program in my district in Staten Island? Um, and are there income requirements? And how is the outreach being done to ensure that everybody who is eligible um, to access this program um, is made aware of it? Right. I'm going to ask Kate Homan from CTO to help us with that answer. And to the degree that we don't have details concerning that. We'll need to get back to you soon on that as well. But let's see if Kate has some information. Sure. Uh, well, I would just generally say that, you know, certainly the, the city agrees that uh, universal broadband is essential to building a fair and equitable city. Um, as I think um, the committee knows, universal broadband is a key part of the CTO's portfolio. And we're doing, we've been doing work on a number of fronts um, to address the issue. Um, for a number of years, including, as was mentioned, developing a, a citywide internet master plan to achieve universal broadband. Um, we're focused on that on that broader effort. I can I, I don't have information in front of me about that particular federal effort. Um, I'm happy to follow up with my colleagues in the office and, and get back to you about that. Um, I, I think this is really a critical issue, especially when we talk about the inequities and and the digital divide. How is it that um, that no one can give me any kind of information on a program that's scheduled to bring $7 billion to New York City? Um, I, I find it a little disconcerting that we don't know about it. it you know, the program was passed in December and um, 
and this is definitely going to be an asset to our ability to provide um, services to those um, communities that have, especially our seniors, that have, you know, historically been, um, you know, uh, victims of, of the digital divide. Um, mm -hmm. Your question. How soon can you get me that information if you don't have it now? I need to know how soon you can get that information to. to yeah, I, I'm just saying I don't have it personally. It's not an issue that I'm personally working on. And we have colleagues in the office who are preparing comments on that. And I can get back to you very quickly. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I, I wanted to follow up with that. I mean, this is money uh, that. It's great. I mean, this was part of the $900 billion federal stimulus that was passed in December. That has the $3.2 billion for new emergency broadband benefit. And they have the criteria about uh, who's qualified, people who have SNAPs or Medicaid would qualify. And the program offer a $50 monthly subsidy for broadband and a discount tablets for laptop up to $100. I mean, and then this program has like a, a early bird, get the worm, so you gotta apply and then money's gonna run out. I'm surprised the city are not aware of that. And then also the governor in his uh, fiscal 2022 uh, executive budget also proposed a $15 per month uh, broadband service for low income family. I mean, the mayor, the mayor's office Shouldn't, shouldn't they be like really aware of this? Like, okay, how do we get the money uh, to New York City seniors and residents, low-income residents? Somebody should be looking out for this. Again, it's not that we're not aware of it. It's just not an item that I'm personally working on. I do have colleagues in the office who are, and I'd be happy to follow up. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, uh, Michael, are, is DIFTA with the calls um, that the providers are making? Or are they also, are you also telling them to, to let people know about these programs so they can get ready uh, to apply? Right. Or do you have the number of seniors who could really use these programs and to make sure when you're doing your, your wellness call, your vaccine call, to also talk about uh, that these you know, programs are available that they could apply to get to get access, what that access. Yes, I mean, you know, the point that you make about the broadband access uh, legislation and that Council Member Rose raised as well, very, very important. You know, as Kate said, she has colleagues working on this and we'll definitely get back to you very soon. And you're right, DIFTA's job as we hear about this, which we'll hear very soon and how the city will tap into this uh, legislation and the funding stream. Uh, our job is to get the word out about that. And so we will have that on the front burner. Okay, sure. so you uh, should get back, yeah. get back to us uh, as quickly as, so, so we want to make sure that our senior don't lose out and our low income family don't lose out. But Absolutely. I mean, this is first come first serve. So it's just like all the other federal program, you know, you find out too late, you're out. <laughs> so we want to make sure that the information uh, get to our seniors as quickly as possible. We understand and we'll get back to you really soon as Kate said. Uh, Chair Holden, do you have any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Co-Chair uh, Chin. Um, I just want to, I just reached out to four of my senior centers, all very large. And so far, three of the four got back to me. None of them were contacted by DIFTA to issue a vaccine location. One of my senior centers, um, which is one of the, is the largest, has 800 seniors as members that regularly attend. I can go there in an afternoon before the pandemic and there'd be three or 400 people having lunch there. Very, very large location. Um, one of the four that I did speak to said they reached out to DIF to, to offer their services as a vaccine center and nobody ever got back to them. So something is not right here. I have one of the largest senior populations in my district. None of the senior centers have been contacted. Um, you testified, Mr. Cruz, that 
you have reached out to a hundred of the 200 and uh, so um, senior centers. Are you doing every district? Are you doing every zip code? Are you making sure that you're reaching out to enough that would cover the population of New York City? We, um, uh, first of all, the, the, the reach out to the, to the centers would be coordinated by the vaccine command center, as I understand it. We have at DIFTA- so wait a minute, you reported that you, you, hold on. You, you reported that you've reached out to a hundred or so that no, you no, find no. eligible. No, we, we survey, we have information. About, right, we have information about all the sites. We have the square footage. Um, we have information about um, the sites. And then we looked at all of our sites and then sent this information to the vaccine command center. That's, that's what we did. We didn't reach out to each center, no. We have this information and forwarded this information to- I, I, would, hope, I would hope that, that the mayor's office and DIFTA would reach out to the centers and start planning this, that if they don't have the refrigerators, get them, get them to them and, and prepare for a rollout and not when the vaccine's available. And then like, like the, when the vaccine rolled out, the city was very slow. And uh, like I said, taking days off, uh, some days uh, inoculating uh, 5,000 and another day inoculating a few hundred. So I, that's why I said we need to plan ahead. And these, these senior centers should be contacted and say, get ready. And I, I'm, again, we haven't seen that. If, what's, what's the problem with calling all the seniors? There's not that many to call them all and say, let's, let's start planning this. All right, thank you, uh, uh, co-chair. Thank you, Chair Holder. Uh, yeah, I mean, we will also, you know, talk with the vaccine command center and push again. I mean, they know that infrastructures are there, we're ready. I mean, they gotta help us prepare and let the senior center know what's needed and they can, they can get ready. And that should be part of the plan. Um, any other questions from other council member? There are no other hands raised, Chair. Okay, so I just wanted to, um, you know, thank this panel, um, Deputy Commissioner, and everyone for testifying. And we will follow up uh, with additional questions that we did not uh, address. And uh, we look forward uh, to getting it done, okay? Getting the centers open, getting um, seniors connected. Um, and also I think with the, with the virtual program that the senior centers are doing, uh, it probably would be good uh, for DIFTA to reach out to them uh, to do some workshop about, you know, the, uh, the vaccine and, and, and they should, you know, if they have any question so that we make sure that we get the correct um, information out to them. So thank you again for being here today. Um, committee Council, would you like to uh, call up the next panel? Yes, thank you, Chair. We will now turn to public testimony. Once more, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify uh, in a panel. Council members who have asked, who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom and you will be called on after each panel has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Our first panel will be Thomas Camber from Older Adults Technology Services, Christian Gonzalez from Brookdale Center for Healthy Aging, Robert Vexler from Brooklyn Fiber, and Beth Finkel from AARP. Thomas Camber, you may begin once you've been given the cue. Time begins now. Time begins. Yes, you can hear me okay? Excellent. Um, 
I want to thank the um, the council for holding this hearing and for inviting us to speak. Um, and uh, also, um, I can answer some of the questions around the emergency broadband benefit after this testimony if people want to ask them. Um, while I was preparing my testimony for today, I went back and looked through some old records and I found a hearing that the city council held in October 28th, 2005, which is the first hearing that I ever testified at. And it was called Circuits and Seniors Assessing the Technology Needs of Senior Citizens. A couple of quotes from the, um, the briefing paper that we were using there for that council hearing. Technology is quickly being seen not only as a vital outlet for per pertinent information, but also as a portal through which seniors can get in touch with loved ones or plug into online communities. There's a growing gap between seniors and technology. There are a number of successful initiatives presently active in the city and the feedback has been very positive. The city should consider allocating funds for programs that train seniors to use technology, working with the nonprofit sector to decide what needs to be done and gathering relevant data. 16 years later, the situation hasn't changed very much and we're observing many of the same alarming facts and trends that were identified in this hearing, except that today approximately 21,000 older adults have died from the coronavirus. Oates research shows that 40% of New Yorkers over the age of 65 lack wireline internet at home. So approximately 8,400 senior citizens died this year in New York City from coronavirus and did not have reliable home broadband. They had no way to participate on Zoom calls with family, no way to order food or supplies online, no way to manage their finances safely, and no way to go online for reliable up-to-date information about how to stay safe from the virus. While the rest of us were home using every technology tool available to avoid getting sick, these individuals were forced to make life and death decisions about exposing themselves to a deadly pathogen just to carry out daily activities. How many died because they had to do something in person that could have been done online if they only had a simple internet connection? We recently asked seniors to, who participated in our Senior Planet programs to let us know if they found the internet helping help them stay safe during COVID. And in a single day, we received 196 responses, every single one making the case that technology was an essential ingredient for survival during COVID. People referred to it as a godsend, quote, essential and a lifesaver, and commented on how it helped them maintain social connections, manage finances, order food, and connect to fitness programs online. People have talked about our OATS programs quite a bit during this hearing, so I won't go through all the details, but um, since 2005, when we were founded, the city council was our first uh, public dollar that supported this program. And we think of ourselves as, city, as a city council success story, but we've built our program up to the point where we're serving tens of thousands of people a year. We've served 60,000 people on Zoom uh, through, the, through December 31st this last year. And we've expanded our programs into five different states now. We applaud the efforts of city leaders like Mayor de Blasio and Commissioner Cortez Vasquez and CTO Farmer. And I'll stop just a second and say the staff um, are also been amazing. Michael Bosnick and uh, Kate Homan and others who testified today are really, really amazing. Um, the last point is that our funding in the last five years as an organization, OATS has doubled in size in the last five years, but our city council, our overall city public funding for programs like this has actually going, gone down in the last five years. So we're calling on the city to make more of a substantial uh, commitment to focusing on these programs because less than 1% of funding allocations from NYCHA, I'm sorry, from New York City Aging focus on technology right now. Thank you. Thank you. We will next hear from Christian Gonzalez. Time begins. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me? We hear you. Great. Um, so hi, my name is Cristian Gonzalez Rivera, and I'm the Director of Strategic Policy Initiatives at the Brookdale Center for Healthy Aging. Uh, we're CUNY's Aging Research and Policy Center and a part of Hunter College. So thank you, uh, Chairs Chin and, uh, and Holden, uh, and members of the committees for holding this oversight hearing uh, to draw attention to really one of the most important lessons that the city must draw from this COVID-19 pandemic, and that is the vital necessity to protect the health and safety of older New Yorkers by ensuring that they have access to technology. And along those lines, just this morning, uh, we released a report, as, as Chair Chin uh, mentioned in her opening remarks, uh, on how to ensure that older New Yorkers can age well by providing meaningful access to technology. Um, the report draws on months of research, including dozens of conversations with providers of services to older adults, experts, and others uh, to document the evolving tech challenges uh, that older adults and their service providers have been facing as a result of the pandemic. Uh, it also rec uh, includes a review of literature on what motivates older adults to get online, and also importantly, a demographic analysis of, older, un of unconnected older adults 
that shows how deeply um, lack of connectivity among older adults is related to socioeconomic disadvantage. Uh, and so that report is available on our website, um, brookdale.org right now. Uh, so, and I'll, highlight, I'll discuss a few um, highlights now. Um, so chances are that those of us who depend on regular internet access at home, which likely includes all of us, you know, right here on the screen um, right now, or most of us, uh, have really been grateful to order stuff online and have Zoom dinners with friends and see our doctors without actually going to the clinic. But for the 474,000 New Yorkers aged 60 and above who lack internet access at home, either through broadband or mobile or any other means, have not been able to do so. And as a result, they've been among the most isolated people in this pandemic. And in fact, older, uh, unconnected older New Yorkers are missing out on a lot. Uh, they're missing out on telehealth, which has great potential to help them manage chronic conditions and, act to and access preventive care, uh, an opportunity to reduce social isolation and so many of the other uses that have been mentioned already. But the important thing is that internet access is not the end of the story. A device and Wi-Fi are of little use if you don't know how to use them. So one of the most important things that the council can do is to ensure that any city investments in expanding internet access recognize that internet does not stop at having your apartment or building wired for internet. Meaningful access to technology is a three-legged stool. It includes access to appropriate devices, access to an internet connection, and the skills and tech support to thrive online. And that last one, that's the skills and tech support, is by far the most important, specifically for older adults, since that's what they lack the most. Um, and um, as you know, many providers learned, I mean, it's like, this is a very hands-on process that starts with identifying the older adults' needs first. No, and then figure out, this is the last piece. I mean, helping them figure out mm -hmm. how to solve their problems through technology. You know, it doesn't, you know, as, as Tom Camber knows very well as well, the hook is not often, how do I use the internet? The hook is, how do I manage my diabetes? How do I get in contact with my, uh, with uh, my loved ones? How do I get a job? How do I, you know, expand my, my purse making business into online? Yeah. Those are the problems that people want to solve. So the investments need to start with that work, helping people solve their problems and how technology can be a tool. Uh, much more details in the report. Um, and thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Next, we'll hear from Robert Vexler. Time begins. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Chair Holden and Chair Chin. I, I don't have a prepared statement, but I, I can tell you I am the founder of Brooklyn Fiber. Mm -hmm. We're an um, internet service provider based in, in Brooklyn. We prim primarily provide service to what you may refer to as digital deserts or historical digi digital deserts, parts of Brooklyn um, and, um, and parts of Queens now. Um, also parts of Manhattan that traditionally have very limited access to broadband. The, uh, the biggest offenders for that are definitely parts of Brooklyn. If you look at the digital, at the master plan from the city, there are many parts of, um, of Brooklyn which are white or, um, or light blue, meaning there's only one option for ISPs, for internet service providers. Um, just listening to the testimony today, I can uh, completely sympathize with um, what Mrs. Ms. Holland said earlier about the cost of her broadband, um, as well as the um, limited options that she may have. The reason for, for this from our perspective is a lack of access, infrastructure, as well as competition. Um, all three of those will lead to, to, um, lead, lead to one another. Um, mm -hmm. The lack of the, the infrastructure problem inside Brooklyn, I can speak to directly, um, is this. Um, there, the internet master plan, which is, which is well-meaning and very smart, um, calls for broadband access to all New Yorkers, um, I believe by 2040 or, or some, some future date. Um, the one thing that I, I believe is left out is the ownership over the infrastructure. The way to make this all happen from our perspective as an ISP is for the city to take charge of running fiber line internet down the areas of through the parts of the city that are most in need of broadband. So um, we get calls every day from Flatbush, from East New York, from Bushwick, from, um, from um, <clears throat> Brownsville. These are typically uh, lower income areas that have one 
if they're lucky, two access, two points, two two choices for broadband service. Um, what happens then is you have uh, no downward pressure on prices, no upward pressure on broadband plans. If the city wants to actually, if the city is serious about providing broadband access to all New Yorkers, especially those in underprivileged areas, it needs to take charge. It needs to take charge of the infrastructure part of it. If the city were to run wireline internet um, fiber down the parts of Brooklyn that I can only speak to Brooklyn really that um, need it most, we as the providers would lease out those those fibers those those connections and last mile to the actual consumer. That will create massive amounts of competition. I'm expired. No problem. You could finish. Yeah, Robert, finish. Sure, sure. Um, um, my, my point is that who, whoever controls the infrastructure controls the timeline. So to make this a realistic endeavor, the city needs to put um, its, its money where its mouth and, and its hopes are and actually take control of the infrastructure. Lease out that fiber to companies like my own and we will provide service to those areas that are underserved um, with a combination of wireline service as well as fixed wireless service. And you will see a massive adoption of broadband services, particularly in those, are, those areas that are underserved now, as well as a downward pressure, massive downward pressure on prices. If I could just say one last thing, um, as an ISP, I can tell you that there is absolutely just kind of apropos of this meeting, should have um, their broadband prices um, going up. Um, I'm not tooting our own, home, but our own horn, but we've never raised a single price. There's been no price creep in our plans and there's no reason there should be in Verizon's or Optimum's or anyone else's. If you start with a $40 plan or a $20 plan, um, there's enough meat on the bone from our end to keep that price at 40 or 20 um, for the life of that plan. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you. We will hear from Beth Finkel. Hi, first of all, I wanna thank uh, Council Member Chen and Council Member Holden for convening this. It is so important. I think everything that we've heard just reinforces that. I'm not gonna go through my testimony because you have it written, uh, but you know, I'm uh, head of ARP New York, uh, over three quarters of a million members, 50 plus in New York City, over two and a half million in New York State. And what you're talking about today gets at the heart of the needs of every person, 50 plus in New York City. We know that uh, although 51% of older Americans say that they have bought at least one tech product in the last year, that is not prevalent among low income or in a lot of communities of color and we need to have that front and center. I think what we've heard from so many of my esteemed advocacy uh, uh, partners is that we now have what, I hate to go back to Thorstein Veblen, for those of you who might remember that name, who called this cultural lag. When the cars were first invented, uh, you know, there were no highways to take the cars through. And right now we are facing that same thing with this broadband broadband lag. It is a cultural lag. And unfortunately, it's affecting communities of color in those cultures, even at a greater extent. This is about working people. This is about people who are still pursuing, trying to get more education. This is about telehealth. This is about access to the vaccines. Uh, this is about access to benefits. It, it is every realm of people's lives. And so that's why we're so excited that you're doing this today. I want to assure you that we are working at the state level, looking at the broadband accessibility. We've got a bill that's on the governor's desk right now that would go back and survey properly where there is and where there isn't broadband. And at the same time, making broadband affordable, which everyone else has pointed to. I want to say one more point. This is also about civic involvement. How does an everyday citizen get involved with civic involvement today? We can't get to the, to the steps of City Hall. AARP has hundreds of thousands of activists in New York State. And how do they get through? How do they get through? And how do they make their presence known? And how do they make their opinions known if they can't get on the internet 
and show that. So we really need to do that. I do want to separately applaud Oates and Tom for the work that he, they're doing. And just as a side, they are now part of the ARP family, which we're very proud of. Uh, but we really, we really need to keep driving this forward. So I want to applaud you all, all the city council people that are on this um, hearing right now. This is so very important and ARP is here to help. So please call in. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. That That is all the members for this panel. Chair Chen, uh, any questions? Yeah, uh, Tom, so can you uh, explain a little bit more about the federal program? I mean, uh, the yeah, money was, was allocated. It's passed as part of the emergency stimulus package in December. The FCC is responsible for implementing the program and there's $3.2 billion for broadband subsidies and it's couched at $50 a month. And they put together limited guidelines for how the money will be distributed in the original um, uh, bill language. But they are currently taking comments for uh, public comments because it's an FCC program. They have to open up all these programs for public commentary and those comments are due on the 25th of January. My understanding is that uh, the mayor's office of the chief technology office uh, will be filing comments on that. I'm assuming that's true. We will certainly be filing comments um, and I hope, I think ARP is also finally comments that we've been speaking with folks over there. So, um, but it's very important that people make clear that those dollars need to be available for older adults um, because many of these programs are very, very heavily tilted toward young people to close the homework gap. And while we absolutely support getting everybody online, the challenge here is that so often the, the resources are, people are so focused on the school issues because kids are taking classes without laptops and it's really important. They're forgetting that there's, uh, we've just done a research study that shows that 21 million older adults in the United States do not have broadband internet at home that we're about to issue that study next week. And it's a real high priority to get those rules written to make sure that people are both making it easy for um, enrollment and engagement for older adults through the you know mechanisms that are available, the AAA systems and things like that. And then finally, it's really only enough money to if everybody signs up who's eligible, um, there's only enough money for about four months worth of subsidies, maybe five months. Um, and so there's a question about what happens afterwards and we're gonna need a concerted public effort. If it's a successful program, this is the first time there's ever been a broadband subsidy in the United States that's available for older people to use that's federally funded. There's never been one before. It's kind of like section eight, but for, for technology and, and, young, and, and people in, in need. So it's a great um, kind of opening of the door for us to do something. Uh, South Korea has a subsidy for seniors using technology. Uh, it's something that we really ought to try to support on an ongoing basis. And it would really support all the other things people have talked about today. Great, uh, thank you. And I think also Christian was talking about that, you know, it's not just enough to uh, get the access that we may have to make sure that we have, you know, resources for training and, and tech support. And that's really critical because like, what happened if the computer goes out or you're doing something and then you don't know how you lost that page? I might say, by the way, that the, the, the way the funds are written right now, there is no funding for tech support or training at all in that system. It's deliberately written to not do that. And so they're, um, they're just kind of leaving it open to states and localities. Uh, if, if we want to supplement, you know, New York City has the largest program in the country because of the work that we've been doing with the government. And by the way, thank you to all the council members who supported our program. Um, and so we actually have a kind of, we're, we're a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of being able to implement, but there is no money federally right now for those resources that you described. So when you, when we're talking about this, uh, this broadband, you know, subsidy uh, from the Fed. So I think part of the comments we can also put in that it's not just enough to provide the subsidy, but you also have to provide the training and, and the tech support. Right. And you might mention yeah. that the, the, the previous program that was um, which, from which Connected Communities emerged, which is the program that Kate and others were talking about, was a program that was funded through the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, which is part of the Department of Commerce. That included not just that had seven billion dollars for infrastructure, um, but it also included, uh, I, I believe, three and a half billion dollars nationwide for broadband adoption services and training. So that model already exists and, and it was very successful uh, given how quickly it was rolled out last in, during the last economic crisis. There's a, there is a, uh, a, you know, a predecessor for this approach. Can you send us that information so that- uh, I'll send yeah. it to you. 
And the other, the other thing is that with the, the governor's uh, executive budget, uh, but that also just for providing broadband service. So, so that might be another opportunity to add. Can, can I comment very briefly on that? Yeah. It, so the, we are 100% supportive of the government governor um, calling for this. Um, I do think it's really important, first of all, to incorporate conversations with the large infrastructure providers like Verizon and um, and Charter and, and companies like that in these conversations. I really think they should be invited to hearings like this. And apparently, uh, I, you know, Verizon hasn't been really reached out to around this stuff. They're a major asset for these things and can help us close the gap there. And I will say that when we do these franchise agreements, they're super wild, in, wildly desperate in terms of who provides service. So Comcast, which is not in New York State, has a thing called Internet Essentials that provides um, $10 a month internet to people all over the country in, in 40 different states. And seniors are eligible. We did a calculation that 53% of older adults in Comcast areas are eligible, eligible for Internet Essentials. In New York State, the comparable program is run through Charter and Spectrum. Only 2% of seniors are eligible for that program because it's very narrowly constricted to SSI recipients. So that we're just not, we're not closing the gap and we're letting all these horses out of the barn without closing really good deals that are really representing the needs of the older adult population. We've got to do a better job in both collaborating with and also, you know, really like holding the line to make sure people are serving real numbers of seniors. We asked the state how many people are being served under that broadband subsidy from Spectrum and the State Public Utilities Commission got back to us and said they don't know because they don't even require them to report on it. Oh, that's. So we don't have the data. What Beth was saying before about broadband mapping, that 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 bill is a, 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 a kind of a no-brainer to get started. We need to know what's going on out there because there's a real gap between what people say the internet looks like and what the real experience is, especially in poor communities. I think Robert's comments are really well taken on that. We have to be much more aggressive and much more urgent around these issues. We knew the problem was gonna come before COVID. We didn't solve it. And now look at what we're left with. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, Beth, so that we got to make sure that we also let us know how we can also help, you know, push the bill forward and also get the governor to provide more, more support, you know, for trainings and, and just real quick on the that bill that we're talking about. It's on the governor's desk. He's got to sign it by January 31st. So yes, oh. a letter of support from the uh, New York City Council to ask him to please sign it please do, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, please send us the information so that yeah. we can get on it right away. Thank you. Yeah. Chair Holden? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chair Chin. Uh, and, and thank you, panel, for excellent uh, testimony. And uh, I, I also wanna thank uh, Tom Camber uh, mm -hmm. for votes um, for the, your wonderful program that uh, I fund uh, in my senior centers. Um, in fact, I go to their graduations when they graduate, <laughs> when the class graduates, uh, and they give them a certificate. Um, and you can see that the seniors that, that have taken the course and could be on the iPad or it could be on how to use uh, a smartphone, but it's like they've been born again almost. Like they, they suddenly, a new world opened up to them and they're so excited. And I mean, I go to, I go to try to, you know, pre-pandemic, I went to every graduation and, and it was really, it's probably the, the best money that I invested uh, in the senior center because you can see it opens mm -hmm. up so many possibilities, new horizons for the seniors. And I, I just wish that the administration would continue to you know, actually expand this program because it's so, so important um, for our seniors. And because um, we are in an online world now and, we haven't done enough. And I think your job would be easier if we had universal broadband that the mayor promised back in 2014. Um, on it. You know, I, I, I think that's, you know, because it is expensive. And, um, and I agree, the franchise agreements that, you know, hopefully we'll get soon, uh, in, it'll expand it and we will have universal broadband. And uh, we, then we could start doing what we're supposed to be doing. Thank you. And, and um, can, I, can I mention one more thing? I'm sorry. The Senior Planet website has free classes every day. And so a lot of those programs, uh, Council Member Holden that you've been, or Chair Holden that you've been attending in person are now available for free online. And we've had hundreds and hundreds of people in each of those classes 
Um, you know, we have Tai Chi today and classes on wow. Zoom for Council Member Chin so that she can work on her her um, her reading <laughs> technique there. We have a morning stretch. We've got classes in Spanish tomorrow and Fit Fusion. So all of that stuff is available and they're super highly rated. We have a 92 uh, net promoter score from seniors participating. And one critical point though is those programs are open enrollment, so you don't have to pre-register. The advantage of that is that it reduces friction for people to participate, but the negative is that we don't know exactly how many people are non-duplicated repeat visitors. And so what you were asking Michael Bosnick earlier, while it's really important, is only a slice of the overall up, you know, environment that people are coming online. And we need to balance the pre-registration control and data collection with the openness and friction-free approach to just letting everybody come to many of these sessions. So we've been doing you know, tens of thousands of people over the last few months, but it's really important that we keep mo some of these systems completely open and we'll know less, but we'll serve more people this way. Tom, we got to get you on the uh, mayor's uh, vaccine uh, task force. <laughs> I'm staying away from that. <laughs> no, you got, we got to get you on there because somebody's got to represent seniors and actually <laughs> know how to communicate, know what's available and, and how to reach them. But um, and, and Beth, we might even get you on that because uh, I, I'd like to know Beth, the Tom's place because mm -hmm. I agree with you. There's nobody representing seniors. And so uh, yeah. Council Member Holden, I really, really appreciate you saying that because I, I've noticed that also. Yeah, we'd so be happy they, to help if we could pay roll. It's like they left the seniors out in their rollout, and they're the first to be vaccinated, and they didn't they didn't figure it out. And it's just it shows you. Um, you probably have a. I don't know if there's any seniors on the mayor's task force. I I, I don't know if anybody understands how to talk to them, how to reach them. Uh, certainly, Tom and, and you would, and and Christian obviously. Um, but you know, Beth, I'd like to just get your opinion. Like, how would you solve the situation that we're in now with the, with the not being able to reach the seniors, uh, not being able to educate them? Um, forget, you know, like I mentioned, forget about technology for a second, because obviously they have a problem, right? There's a problem with technology, at least for the vast majority of the seniors, and we're not going to solve it tomorrow. But let's say we had enough vaccines. How would you, how would you get the, uh, the seniors vaccinated? Do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Well, I... I actually, the, you know, the, the, the mayor does have a subcommittee for older adults, which I am on. It meets every mm -hmm. Friday. I was actually on it yesterday because it was on a Thursday. So I do want to say that. And they have made some strides in terms of transportation and some other pieces. I think, though, that um, as we keep highlighting here, it's not all about technology. We wish that everybody could use technology. But sometimes you have to go back to the old fashioned way of touching people locally with the local community organizers, with the neighborhood watch groups, um, you know, with the people who, you know, have that local um, uh, ability. So going back to the old fashioned and, and I'm the community organizer from way back, right? Uh, looking at doing it as old fashioned community organizers would do it. Um, some would say you might want to borrow what Stacy did down in Georgia, going door to door that way. I know there's issues around door to door with COVID, uh, but I think there's a way that we could do it in a safe way. And you know, there is a, that, that really old fashioned way of getting the flyers out that connect to people, that connect them to an 800 number that works, that has the capacity. And that's really important because the state 800 number had a two hour wait time. It's now down to a 10 minute wait time, which some people would still say that's too much, um, but getting those call-in centers uh, really up to speed with the with people who can answer the questions and direct them and handhold them and go on and go on the sites for them and help them do it. Uh, so I think that that would be the beginning of that. So again, or even like, Stacey yeah. Abrams model, she's pretty good at this, you know. <laughs> or even you know with the Meals on Wheels programs that we have in New York City, mm -hmm. uh, contacting them through that where they deliver the meals and then they have a little flyer saying, here's what you yeah. know, you, we're gonna be calling you or here, call this number and so forth and so forth. You know, we have to get creative here. Maybe they're doing that, I don't know, but I haven't heard of it. Um, well, Meals on Wheels is involved, but I think the issue that you bring up about the homebound, you know, mm -hmm. it's one thing to provide transportation to people who are a little fragile, but when you're talking about homebound, homebound, that's another issue. And yeah. also the people who are providing care for those homebound, because if you're not coming out of a licensed home care agency, if it's informal or private pay, who knows? And with the new strain coming out, 
um, you know, the, the, the contagion is going to just multiply. So we really need to make sure that people are getting the vaccine and um, the people who are coming in close contact with them are. So thank you so much. This is all so important. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, back to you, co-chair. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think that's why it's so important that that minimally, at least in the next uh, senior center RFP, that there should be you know funding available you know for uh, training and tech support uh, that you know groups like oh this should be funded by the city. I mean the council you know council <laughs> discretionary funding is is extra. It should be baseline in DIFTA's budget. And that, I think that's what we've been advocating for. It's like with the senior centers and kind of like, it should be a no brainer that that, that should be part of, part of their budget um, to that. So I just want to thank this panel and thank you for all the great work that you do for our senior. And Christian, looking forward to reading the full report. And we did utilize some statistics from your reports because you sent it to our staff quickly, but we, we're gonna get the whole version and share with uh, other council member. So committee council, can you call the next panel? Yes, thank you. The next panel will be Melissa Sklarz from Sage Senior Center, Ravi Reddy from Asian American Federation, Sharanya Pillai from India Home, and Mary Archana Fernandez from South Asian Council for Social Services. Mm -hmm. Melissa Sklarz, you may begin whenever you've been given the, the cue. Time starts now. Great, let me set my stopwatch. Okay, now we're on the same page. So my name is Melissa Sklarz. I'm the Senior Government Relations Strategist at SAGE. Thank you, Council Members Holden and Chin and your committees for the hearing today. Founded in 1978, SAGE is the country's first and largest organization dedicated to improving the lives of LGBT older people, leading provider of services and supports for LGBT older people in New York City. LGBT elders are living at the epicenter of the pandemic. Studies show higher levels of poverty, food, housing insecurity, lower access to healthcare and supportive services, social isolation, thin support networks, and mistrust of government and other institutions based on historical discrimination. All of these are worse for transgender elders and LGBT older people of color. Ending in in-person services and programs has made access to technology crucial, if not life-saving. Our elders rely on SAGE for support, community and connection. We have six SAGE centers across the city and we continue to modernize with both quantity and quality of services to our elders. Uh, throughout the pandemic, we've shifted capacity and resources to adapt to the new reality and reimagining our services for virtual and telephonic delivery. Uh, we've not had any um, programming since mid-March, duh, like anyone. Uh, to ensure that we have access to community connection, we've worked on reinventing our programming. Uh, we have offered more than 100 virtual safe center programs a week, attracting hundreds of elders and allies, uh, including programs such as SAGE positive for HIV uh, positive elders and SAGE vets for our veterans. Uh, one of our new programs is SAGE Sense. It's a financial wellness app uh, specifically for LGBT elders. Uh, for financial uh, stability, another Sage Connect uh, nationwide network of volunteers to help our New York elders uh, to supplement our in-person centers. Uh, so I want to add my voice to all the things that have been said today. We're hopeful that Department of Aging will partner to increase access to technology with um, bulk purchasing technology for elders, which ensure access connection to older people. Um, we want uh, that in spite of our many uh, programs and services, too many of the programs funded do not adequately meet uh, what is needed today. Changing this need should be a priority of the city. New York needs better broadband and Wi-Fi access and public housing. Millions have been um, uh, committed to spend for um, NYCHA and for underserved New Yorkers. Um, and universal broadband, and this should be included uh, 
with older adult centers, including our state centers. And we support Governor Cuomo's uh, proposal. We, uh, Governor Cuomo's proposal to improve access to telehealth, allow greater flexibility where and how patients use it. Uh, to, let's see, for, to regarding telehealth coverage, technology expansion, and uh, more professional development. Thank you for the chance to speak here today, um, and thank you for the council's support of SAGE and its programming. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. We will next hear from Ravi Reddy. Time starts now. Thank you to committee chairs, Margaret Chin and Robert Holden for holding this joint hearing. I'm Ravi Reddy, the Associate Director for Advocacy and Policy at the Asian American Federation. Our organization represents a collective voice of more than 70 member nonprofits serving 1.3 million Asian New Yorkers. But 13% of the city's senior population now identify as Asian. Among these seniors, one in four Asian New Yorkers live in poverty and 72% of Asian seniors have limited English proficiency and comprise more than two thirds of the Asian senior population in many neighborhoods across Brooklyn and Queens. One in four LEP Asian seniors in the city do not have access to the internet at home, and almost one in six don't have access to broadband internet at home either. So vaccination efforts are highlighting exactly what we're here to discuss, barriers to access to technology. So regarding the vaccine, the needs of Asian seniors are twofold, access to accurate and reliable information on the vaccine itself, and updated information on eligibility requirements and vaccination locations. But while providing online access to information may be expedient, doing so at the expense of in-depth community engagement, especially with community-based organizations with significant relationships in these communities, puts our most vulnerable at a grave disadvantage. We are encouraged that council members and speakers before me are aware of the difficulties of getting a vaccination appointment. The frustration is palpable in our community as well, but with the additional layer of resignation, a reflection of yet another system built without us in mind. Access is contingent on simplicity of process, but more than anything, access is contingent on engagement. Hear our community-based organizations, see how our elders consume information, engage with who they trust. And COVID-19 has dramatically impacted the delivery of just about every other service our seniors need as well. Access to reliable virtual healthcare, for example, depends on access to a device, stable internet, and oftentimes an in-depth knowledge of software applications. So software application interfaces. And it's not just our seniors, but also service providers who are struggling. Our community agencies are being overwhelmed by demand at the same time that services of all kinds are needing to shift to technological alternatives like ESL and citizenship classes. The transition to internet-based applications is creating bottlenecks on both ends, a strained capacity among small CBOs who need to shift services online while demand remains unchanged or is actually increasing. The needs aren't changing and the means aren't keeping up. So here are our recommendations. First and foremost, online registration for vaccine appointments is already excluding Asian, senior center, Asian seniors. The city must see CBOs who have existing buy-in from our senior communities as co-pilots in the effort, providing messaging and resources to help Asian seniors get the vaccinations they need. Second, to that end, grant and capacity support must be made available to avoid interruptions in services deemed essential by our community members from meal delivery to telehealth. Having consistently demonstrated how city funds can be most efficiently used, our partners need funding and they need in-kind technological assistance from funding for tablet distribution to funding for broadband access and CBO senior. I'm expired. I've just Please one more recommendation. Continue. Finally, uh, thank you. Finally, local law 30 implementation must be fully, um, fully uh, funded across city agencies falling under its purview. In addition to that, we need to amend contracting processes to allow Asian-led nonprofits to more accurately reflect the cultural and language expertise they bring when serving our community members. The needs of our CBOs and the needs of our seniors are systemic, and uh, we're seeing that revealed in this crisis. So we're working on two planes right now. We need immediate help, and then we need systemic structural help. So with that said, we understand that the city and state are facing financial challenges of their own, but we have always gotten the most bang for our buck when we've looked to the expertise of community-based organizations like those who will be speaking after me for help. On behalf of the Asian American Federation, I wanna thank you for giving us the chance to speak and we look forward to working with all of you to make sure we're up to this challenge. Our seniors depend on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Sharanya Pillai. Time starts now. 
Thank you to the City Council Committees on Aging and Technology, Chair Chin and Chair Holden for providing this opportunity for India Home to testify. My name is Sharnia Pillay. I'm Deputy Director at India Home. India Home is the largest senior center program serving South Asian seniors in New York City. During this pandemic, we've continued to be dedicated to culturally competent programs through our home delivered meals and groceries, test and trace community outreach and vaccine awareness in partnership with h, &H and DOHMH and extensive virtual senior center programs. Technology has allowed us to reach new heights during this time and attract clients even beyond New York City in other states and other countries. We have been able to help ensure through our virtual exercise, yoga, meditation, health, nutrition, education, civic engagement, ESL, creative aging programs, that seniors are able to be given enriching programs and are, and are able to stay stimulated and engaged from the safety of their homes. We have also been educating our older adults on the latest health updates through virtual programs and wellness checkup calls consistently over the past few months. While technology has opened up our programs geographically during this pandemic, it has come with its challenges and issues of access, and especially for those who have the lowest tech literacy. 100% of our clients are immigrants and a sizable proportion of our seniors face low English proficiency and are low income, all factors which impact their ability to accessing and navigating technology. There are over 100 low income seniors who take part in our home delivered meal program and 500 plus seniors who have taken part in our grocery programs regularly. But due to a number of barriers, including their lack of access to technological devices, many of them are unable to take part. There are clients who tend to face issues such as diabetes, high blood pressure and high cholesterol who would benefit from taking part in our virtual programs such as exercise, yoga and low impact dance. And they continue to express interest, but they're unable to join because of a lack of an adequate smartphone or an other device. This has also been especially hard for seniors who live alone and do not have supports at home to be able to help them. Furthermore, for those living in family units that depend on their younger grandchildren for their tech devices, the children are oftentimes in school, which gets prioritized over the seniors' needs, and thus makes the devices unable to seniors, um, unavailable to seniors during prime hours of programming. Our team has had to use our limited staff and capacity to train not only the older adults, but ourselves on these new virtual platforms. This has taken a lot of resources to be able to provide the individualized assistance needed for each senior to start using the programs. We're grateful for the more than 21,000 units of virtual program that we have been able to offer during this time, but we need more capacity to be able to support both the training needs for clients and the demands for most of the, more of these programs. We have also tirelessly looked for different funding options for our, to help our clients purchase new technology uh, to no avail. As you all know, the public health crisis we are in is ever evolving. However, the biggest guidance that we've been given in addition to vaccine administration is that it's especially important for our seniors to stay home. Technology is the one way we can help to reach them beyond, beyond the baseline needs of meals and groceries. Social isolation has lethal consequences in old age and technology is a primary way for us to be able to continue to provide the social cohesion and resources necessary to be able to survive during this pandemic. Even beyond the pandemic, when centers reopen, we want to be able to continue these virtual programs so that seniors don't have to choose between their safety and social connectedness. In order for us to continue to serve in the new normal, we make the following recommendations. Direct service organizations like ours need more uh, specific funding to support these programs and continue to provide virtual services to help ensure seniors stay at home safely. We need funding to purchase technology such as smartphones and tablets for the most vulnerable seniors who are isolated and unable to access virtual programs. And we need the IT support and training from DEFTA or the recognition of a need to have the support in-house at organization. Thank you once again for your time and consideration of our requests. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, we'll hear from Mary Archana Fernandez. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Council Member Chin, Council Member Holden, and other members of the Committees on Aging and Technology. I'm Mary Archana Fernandez, Director of Family Support Services at South Asian Council for Social Services, SACS. SACS is a nonprofit community based organization that works to empower immigrant communities through services in the areas of healthcare access and education, senior support services, and food security. We also provide basic and advanced English and computer classes and a summer youth program. All our services are free and provided by staff that speaks over 15 different Asian languages and Spanish and Creole. Each year through our programs, we serve over 25,000 clients. 
As the COVID-19 pandemic spread rampantly th through Queens, we were worried about our seniors, many of whom were isolated even before the pandemic and depended upon community organizations like ours to not only socialize and engage with their peers, but also given their limited English proficiency, they depended upon us for case our case workers for assistance with benefits. Some stopping by the office every other day with a document that they needed explained or for help with writing a check to Medicaid surplus. They look forward to sharing their problems and finding solutions in our weekly Hindi Bengali support groups or playing Antakshari with friends, watching Bollywood movies and sharing a meal with other seniors with whom they shared a common social and cultural heritage. A lot of my colleagues here have spoken about a lack of access. Uh, so I wanna talk about something that we're hearing from our clients. As we move to a virtual platform, uh, as we moved our programming to a virtual platform, we soon realized that this was a new world for many of our seniors, especially for those seniors that we serve, many of whom have never had any form of formal education, have never attended school, and do not know to read or write even their own primary language. One of our seniors mentioned, I feel like I'm not a part of this world anymore. Everything is new and I don't know if I can catch up. This was a common sentiment shared by many. Caseworkers and counselors have worked with seniors to teach them to use web-based platforms such as Zoom or Google Hangouts. While some, especially those with family members to help them out had a much easier time getting used to this new life, many struggled. In our conversation with seniors, we found that many of them expressed disinterest in using technology because of an underlying fear of technology or lack of skills. From our work, we've learned that just providing seniors with technology is not going to help. We have to invest in teaching them to use this technology. We have to empower them to feel confident and comfortable to use this technology. And while we take this endeavor on, it is important to recognize that some of our seniors have been experiencing cognitive delays and appro appropriate training can help to quell those fears and generate interest among seniors. And we have to also make sure that it's, uh, we provide them with online safety training. Older adults are easy victims to online scams, putting their personal information at risk. But with tailored digital literacy training, they can learn to navigate the internet safely and securely. We also want to make sure that as our seniors, uh, I see that I'm running I'm out expired. of time. My, yeah. my last point is that a lot of seniors have been telling us that this has affected their self-esteem not being able to uh, being able to get on the internet or do things. And that is one of the reasons that uh, a lot of them are uh, experiencing symptoms of depression, mood swings. So we have to make sure that the technology, we make this technology friendly for them and easier for them to use. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to this panel chair, if you have any questions. No, I really thank the, the work of this panel. I mean, we totally agree with you. Um, you know, the need for more fundings and support. And I think it really highlight uh, the whole training part and, and the tech support. Uh, because one of the thing about combating isolation, there's so much you can do. I mean, for seniors, the other thing is really learning something new and that will help with dementia and what later, you know, cause we're still, it's lifetime learning. Um, because my husband is learning Chinese and Korean <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> and uh, it's just so much we can do. And we got to make sure that DIFTA has the funding uh, to provide um, not just the equipment, um, but also provide the technical support and, and the training. So I really wanted to you know, thank you all for, for your advocacy. Um, Chair Holden? Yes, um, and I, I just want to say this panel is terrific again. Uh, I, I just want to thank all the, the panelists, but what Mary said about that senior who said that the senior says, I don't feel part of this world anymore. It was very moving. Um, and it, it really speaks to our mission um, as people uh, in, in obviously in government that we have so much more to do. So Mary, that was a moving statement um, and it's so true, but I'd like to ask this panel generally, um, um, what outreach has the city, including DIFTA, conducted to local groups within your target popula population? So uh, we don't have, uh, we're not, uh, we don't have a direct contract with DIFTA. We are majorly funded by uh, our council members. Um, so we have no, we have had no direction or guidance from DIFTA as of yet. 
Um, we do well, have- it could, a, be, Mary, it could even be beyond DIFTA. I'm just saying, what, what outreach, has any outreach been in your, in your target population? Has the city conducted any outreach to, to the seniors through, through local groups in your uh, population? Um, no, nothing specific. We do have some directions from DOH image, which we translate, which our healthcare access team translates and provides them to our seniors. But there is a lot of confusion about vaccines. Um, and I just want to share um, quickly that I had one of my clients who, after great difficulty, was able to, uh, you know, get an appointment to get vaccinated. She went yesterday and then she called me back and saying they don't have the vaccine anymore. So th this was, um, you know, uh, this was very disappointing for her. Okay. And um, that's my other fear that this is going to demotivate and discourage people, uh, seniors from going and getting vaccinated. And I can speak on, um, you know, the guidance from Department for the Aging. Um, you know, we, we are also working with the Test and Trace uh, campaign as well. So we're getting this advice on, on both ends from the city, um, to, you know, di to direct through that, the vaccine navigator portal. But similarly, you know, we've been having a lot of these sites that are, that we're being, being referred to in which the, they're all booked up. The vaccines are not available. There's the shortages. So it is very frustrating. You know, we're trying to walk our seniors through this process and to be coming at this end. And, and we've been reaching out to DEFTA and asking to, you know, directly work with us. We have the space. Can we please, you know, be a hub to be able to support the vaccine? So we are continuously trying to make that happen. And, and we've been, it's been communicated to us because of the vaccine, um, you know, the storage needs that it, that it, yeah. they're not directly working with CBOs. But um, as far as we know, you know, Moderna vaccine doesn't have that requirement. So we can definitely, we have the space to be able to provide it and, and if there is any way that we can set up a vaccination hub at our center, we really would like that because our seniors need it. And, and as you mm -hmm. said earlier, um, Chair Chin, you know, they know where our center is. They'll come and, and we'll be able to facilitate that. And um, if there is any help on that, we definitely would appreciate yeah. that. And and going off of what um, Mary and uh, Sharanya said, I think it's important to note right now that there are no Asian American primary contractors on any contracts right now. We've only been in subcontracting capacities and especially when you hear about the work being done and how efficiently we're spending what little money we're getting. Um, it would make sense, especially when we're in financial straits that there is more primacy given to you know specialty uh, organizations who actually have the expertise to provide these direct services like you've heard. Um, so it's still kind of mind boggling that we've only been in subcontractor positions. Um, this is an opportunity to change that. Thank well, you. that's what we're we're looking for in um, the new RFP. I mean, at least for the senior center, because I know India Home is one of the the ten you know center that served immigrant population that's funded by the council, and we want to make sure that you um, get a um, you know the city contract so you could be an official uh, a senior center, and yeah. uh, that's that's <laughs> what. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to this panel. We have one more panel remaining. A reminder to any council members who are still attending the hearing, if you have any questions for the following panel, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call you in the order that you have raised your hand. Additionally, if we have missed anyone during the course of this hearing that would like to testify, please also use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call you in the order your hand is raised. The final panel will be Curly Serrano, from Sunnyside Community Services Senior Center, Alexander Riley from Legal Aid Society, and Bethel Williams from Project Guardianship. Curly, you may begin when you're given the signal. Time starts now. Hi, my name is, as you said, Curly Zoretto. I am the Director of Older Adults at Sunnyside Community Services. Thank you for the opportunity to present here. Um, our center, as other centers, have been providing crucial support to older adults in New York City during this pandemic. We have been providing support calls, um, assistance, guidance to our older New, York, or the New Yorkers in striving to ensure food security, medical access, and mental health connections. Uh, currently, we have pivoted to assist with access to correct and accurate information about vaccines 
and assisting in securing vaccine appointments, which uh, have been mute. Um, all the while, we are also offering um, virtual activities as they relate to physical, mental support services. The pandemic has resulted in older adults becoming isolated and lonely, and we know that this isolation and loneliness negatively impacts older adults' mental health and overall physical well-being. The lack of connection to family, friends, social network decreases their sense of belonging and being and increases health risk, risk factors. We are providing older adults with exercise classes, nutrition classes, uh, arts, entertainment, mental health support services, medical education, and even celebrate holidays together and other important events. As you can see, I have some pictures of some of our um, activities that we have, and we try to engage the older adults in trying to remain connected. However, during this pandemic, many systematic deficiencies have been highlighted, but a huge resource deficiency is technology. We need resources in order to be technology efficient. Action needs to be taken to assist our older adults in remaining connected with their families, friends, and community. At this point, technological resources are vital in order to secure safe medical access and access to benefits. Seniors and staff are making concessions as to how they help, and it's unfair to make that choice. We need to coordinate efforts across umbrella organizations, government, and community partners to share resources and advance best practices. The need to secure a COVID vaccine is an example of how technology is crucial in accessing medical care but it also highlights the disparity that is caused by the lack of technological resources, particularly in the immigrant and lower income populations. We need assistance in securing resources that allow older adults remaining connected virtually, such as equipment and web access and education. Um, so technology does come with a huge cost. There is talk about the $15 benefit, however, when an older adult is struggling to meet the cost of living, they need to choose. Do you eat? Do you buy medication? Do you pay the rent? Internet access is not going to be one of those choices. It is I'm expired. Oh, so sorry. One second. <laughs> Yet at this time. So we need to, of course, the challenge is obtaining internet safely, um, requiring equipment access, and as everybody else is saying, the resources are support virtual programming for the centers and the clients. Uh, we need to access those resources in order to be able to continue providing that connection that is needed. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Alexander Riley. Time starts now. Thank you very much to the committees for holding this hearing and uh, I won't uh, read verbatim from my prepared testimony, which I'll be submitting shortly, but um, the reason that uh, that I'm here today is to talk about something that um, has not been mentioned thus far in today's hearing, which is the phenomenon of uh, seniors participating in legal proceedings remotely. Um, and this is something that we're very concerned about for, for various reasons. Um, so most of the court proceedings in New York City have been moving forward during the pandemic um, to the extent that they have been uh, remotely via Zoom or Microsoft Teams. Um, but these platforms uh, have very serious limitations in terms of due process rights. For example, judges uh, are less able to assess witnesses' credibility. Um, judges uh, have difficulty evaluating a witness's well being or level of understanding. The tech doesn't always work properly. Um, litigants whose language is, first language is in English have to work through an interpreter. You can imagine how difficult that can be. So, this is difficult for, for any litigant, but especially for older people who, as has been previously discussed, uh, are affected by what's known as the access and skills divide. They don't have the tech, they don't have the knowledge, the facility. Um, so we at the Legal Aid Society believe that, that older people should not be forced to defend themselves in court uh, until, uh, physically or remotely, until courthouses have fully and safely reopened. But the courts are clearly determined to move forward uh, to the extent that the government will, government will allow. So given that, we urge the city to 
to furnish devices and training uh, and ongoing support, as I think it was uh, Mr. Gonzalez and Ms. Fernandez highlighted before, the need for, for tech support for seniors uh, so that seniors can effectively participate. We've been working with uh, Columbia Law School's technology and law clinic to create what we call a, a justice tablet to be used in these uh, remote proceedings. But um, that that's only part of the, the solution. As, as I just mentioned, training and support is necessary. We, uh, a colleague of mine prepared some of the testimony that I'm submitting describing the work that she had to do to prepare a client of ours uh, for her virtual trial in housing court a couple of months ago. And it was hours and hours of work uh, from square one, uh, trying to, to teach somebody who had never touched a computer before how to participate in a remote hearing. And it involved creating visuals and signs to be able to hold up during a court proceeding. Um, fortunately, this person had the aptitude and had a grandson who came in from out of state. I'm to be with her during the proceeding. But, uh, you know, you, you, you can just imagine how challenging this is. Just one last point, R earlier in the pandemic, housing court judges were telling us, oh, um, you know, the, the city, the Department for the Aging is going to be providing this service. They're gonna be providing the tech and the training and so forth for these proceedings. That turned out to be completely untrue. We don't know where they got that idea. So at the moment, this is falling entirely on providers, uh, legal services providers, and we, you know, we don't have the background in this. We're just kind of making it up as we go along. I think we're doing a good job, but we can't do it in, with any sort of volume. So we hope that the city will uh, come up with some kind of a solution to this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Finally, we will hear from Beth Williams. Time starts now. Sorry, Beth, I think you're still muted. Yeah, she's still muted. Sorry about that. Um, speaking of technological difficulties, um, my name is Beth Williams and I am the Deputy Director of Legal Services for Project Guardianship, which is uh, formerly a demonstration project of the Vera Institute of Justice. We are a nonprofit agency that serves as court appointed guardian pursuant to Article 81 of the New York State Mental Hygiene Law. In our 15 years of operation, we have served over 500 individuals in New York City for whom a judge has determined their functional limitations necessitate the assistance of a guardian of either person, property, or both. The overwhelming majority of our clients are seniors. They reside across all five boroughs of New York City. Generally, they live in one of two places, a nursing facility or at their home in the community. Before the pandemic, we were able to visit with each of our clients on a monthly basis, regardless of their location. This enabled us to visibly assess their health, affect, social relationships, and environment, and make fully informed decisions about their course of care. With the onset of the pandemic in March 2020, the visitation restrictions and facilities have prevented us, as well as judges, court-appointed court -appointed counsel, and evaluators from having hands-on access to our senior clients with limited capacity. It is very difficult to holistically monitor the condition of our seniors and to advocate for adjustments to their care when we are unable to see them in person. Due to their functional limitations, many of our clients are unable to use technology to, to connect with us and the nature of the communications with those who can do not lend themselves toward monitoring changes in their physical and mental condition. Because we cannot enter a facility, we are unable to observe the environment in which care is being provided and be watchful for indicators of substandard treatment. It's been our experience that nursing facilities are poorly equipped to provide our senior clients with access to technology that would enable us to visit them via video conferencing, for example. As such, access to our senior clients living in facilities has mostly been via telephone. And for our clients who are unable to use a telephone, the best we can do is have a conversation with care staff about their oftentimes biased perceptions of our clients' well-being. So long as the pandemic continues to spread and access to nursing facilities is denied, we urgently need policies that mandate nursing facilities to provide access through technology to persons under guardianship so that we can ensure that they receive the care that they need 
and that we are in the best possible position to make decisions on their behalf. For our senior clients who reside in the community of whom many are homebound, we have limited in-person visitation to all but the most necessary of circumstances to help prevent the spread of COVID-19 to these most fragile residents of our city. In most instances, our clients who reside in the community have either full-time or part-time home health aides. While we have had better success working with home health aides to access our clients at home via video conferencing technology, there are still barriers such as uh, the availability of broadband, affordable mobile phones, or laptops for our senior clients who are poor and lived on fixed income. There's also a lack of training of home health aides on how to use the technology and a that lack of fire. technical support. Uh, we need funding for data plans and devices for low-income seniors, and we need training for home health care providers on how to use technology like video conferencing to assist us in supporting our seniors. Um, we need quick action to assure that uh, this vulnerable population has meaningful access to technology that will help us assure that our effectiveness as their guardian will not be curtailed precisely when they need it the most. I thank you for the invitation uh, to testify at this hearing. Thank you for your testimony and thank you to this panel. Chair Chen. Yeah, I, I just, I have a couple of questions. Beth, are, are your program connected with other um, local nonprofits or um, community-based you know, community organization that can do some coordination in terms of how to provide the support um, that you're talking about? Like some of the homebound senior, they get home deliver meal Right. So are, are, do they get home deliver meal or is there like a, a way to work with if they get a home deliver meal to work with the home deliver meal agency to see if they also have some resources uh, to help with what you're, you're talking about? Uh, yeah, we do work with uh, a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations and, and agencies in the community. I know uh, SAGE is, is at the hearing and we've worked with them. Um, most of our people who reside in the community have home health aides who help prepare meals and we have grocery delivery services that deliver groceries to them so that nobody has to go out and shop. Um, and uh, people who have more resources, of course, can afford more takeout meals. Um, so generally our, our people are provided for in terms of meals, but uh, if we're not able to actually see them, it's much harder to assess how well they're doing and and to be able to anticipate uh, care changes that might need to happen. Um, and we've had, you know, mixed success with uh, nursing facilities and just getting through to them, uh, let alone uh, being able to uh, borrow a nurse's telephone so that we can use you know Zoom or Skype uh, to to see one of our senior clients in a facility. And uh, our aides have been more responsive uh, for people who are in the community and we've had more success in, in video conferencing, but it's definitely a, a major issue in getting access to technology uh, for, for this portion of, of the senior community that's really extremely vulnerable and fragile and, and doesn't have you know, resources, skills, or ability to do it for themselves. Okay, I mean, I think we should um, you know, follow up with you more in terms of what DIFTA, you know, if DIFTA has a program that can work with you. And it's the same thing with uh, what, you know, Alexander was talking about, you know, with the legal cases. There's got to be some, um, maybe Department for the, the Aging should have some program uh, resources that can help uh, seniors who have to you know, go through this to have the, the training or the equipment. And uh, that's something we'll, we can go back to uh, DIFTA to ask. We would appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Chair Holden. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Chen. Uh, just again, again uh, great panel. And, uh, you know, what Alexander was saying, you know, there's so many hurdles that this pandemic has created. Um, and that is a, that is a, a monumental one, just uh, in the courts and then having people, um, especially seniors, uh, maneuver the technology. It's, uh, I, you know, my heart goes out to you guys who are on, that, on the front lines there. You, you have your work cut out for you and, and we appreciate all the work you do. Um, I just wanna do a shout out to Curly Serrano 
the Sunnyside Community Services, the Senior Center, all the great work you do servicing my district, parts of my district. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've had experience with you guys and wonderful, wonderful organization. I just want to ask a, a question. Um, did uh, DIFTA reach out to you for reallocating funds uh, uh, for technology uh, in your center? Uh, or and then one other question, the second part of the question, um, could you help with the rollout of the vaccine? Could could uh, Sunnyside, um, if if you were asked, help with the because um, you do the Meals on Wheels, you do visit um, seniors that are shut in. Could you help with that with that uh, push? Uh, thank you and thank you. Um, you know, we were, uh, in terms of technology, no, we were not reached out by DIFTA in terms of allocating funds for that. Um, you know, we generally have to do that push uh, for, can we do this with our funds? Um, with regard to the actual, um, we, our organization did receive a survey to see if we would be eligible to participate in providing vaccines. And, and that was uh, responded by, of course, our executive director, Judy Sanwell. Um, so I, I think, you know, that, you know, we certainly approached the commissioner about that. Judy approached the commissioner about that. And I think that's discussions are in place for that. Uh, so there was a survey that was sent out. And, um, but on top of that, I think also uh, Judy did reach out to the commissioner in order to discuss that she is on a panel. Um, you'd been asking about like one thing that we could do, and you know, I think something that would be very helpful because you expressed it very eloquently about the hardship in trying to get a vaccine. I've been spending hours and hours and hours trying to get vaccines for my seniors. It's impossible. Um, one of the things that would be very helpful, like much like Get Food, that we have access to that Get Food dashboard. If they could develop something like that, where we have access to be able to schedule yeah. for our seniors. Because yes, we have to create emails. Every time we go into that DOH website or the New York State website, we have to keep putting the information over and over again. Uh, so if we have access to that and support for that, we're at least in that way, if they don't wanna do it at the senior centers, but we had access to scheduling appointments for the seniors other than going through that general website, it would be so crucial and, and helpful to us. Because right now we're reaching out, we're trying to educate people uh, for me, we have a huge Latin population. They did have a forum on Wednesday. It was all in English. So anyone that spoke Spanish would not be able to benefit from that information. Um, so, uh, so for us, it's really like helping those populations get the correct information, not hear it from other people and, and their interpretation from that. Yeah, and, and I think what will come out of this uh, hearing, and I, I don't want to speak for Chair Chin, but I know, I, I think she's, you know, she's on the same page that we, we're going to petition the mayor's office to use senior centers um, for the vaccine to help out whether it, you, like you said, scheduling it, um, because the seniors, many of them can't do it. And even mm -hmm. if they could do it, they, you have to have some stamina to go through all the steps where I almost gave up a few times. Uh, and yes, I'm a senior, but I have a technology background. And I was challenged, uh, certainly, with the patients on the site for, for four hours. So, but I, I, I uh, Curly, I want to thank you for all the, you know, again, uh, and we do have to take advantage of our senior uh, centers and use them to, to really get to, to roll out this vaccine. And the fact that we haven't seen that yet uh, from the administration um, is really disturbing. But thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, wonderful panel. Thanks again. Yes, uh, yes, I wanted to really thank the panel. I know the survey that Difta was talking about earlier, I mean, they just, and they were saying only 100 of the 249 senior center can qualify. That's impossible, right? You can just help them prepare. Uh, I know that when we did the hearing with the help um, last week, you know, they talk about the vaccine not being stable, it gotta be fro whatever, refrigeration, those things could be worked out. So I think we're, we're gonna work together um, to push the city at the Vaccine Command Center to really work on that. And I think we're looking at like some of the vulnerable, vulnerable population, uh, whether it's guardianship, people with housing court issue, 
uh, we got to figure out a way to, to make sure um, that resources are available so these seniors are protected. Uh, so I think we, we will uh, work with you, Alex and, and Beth. Please, you know, like, I know we'll, we'll read your whole testimony, but definitely reach out um, to our office and see how, how we can, uh, you know, help the situation improve. And I just also wanted to, you know, thank everyone who came today. Uh, thank Chair Holden for holding this uh, hearing uh, with me. I think this is so important. Thank you to all the advocates uh, who joined today and all the staff and uh, all the sergeant for helping uh, to make this hearing go smoothly. And uh, Chair Holden, anything else? Uh, well, I just again want to thank you for holding the hearing and it's, and it's good to partner with you. We have to do this more often. We have a lot of work to do um, going forward. So I, we expect to do this again. Uh, the sooner the better, because I think we touched upon so many issues and we have to get busy now to solve this with legislation or, you know, and hearings and just shining a light on all the, the hurdles that have been set up here for our seniors during the pandemic. And the fact that they're isolated um, and I can say my, I haven't seen my mom really uh, in a year. Um, and so I know what we're going to, you know, she knows what we're uh, going through. And the only thing I could do with her is do FaceTime. And yeah. that's, that's a poor substitute. And um, she gets frustrated with the, the, you know, obviously the technology, mm -hmm. she's going to be 97 in April. Um, and now she has COVID. So, you know, everything mm -hmm. comes, you know, all the families have been affected by this. So we really need to solve this and at least um, get to a point where we're making it easier for the seniors, not tougher. Uh, so uh, thank you all for, you know, for uh, participating in this hearing and thank you. Uh, and thanks really big thanks to my co-chair and to, and, and to committee council. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you to all the, the staff. And so the hearing is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>